Morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, man. Morning. Becoming a theme. That's good. So, we are lucky to have all five members of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission in our hearing today to discuss the priorities of this independent agency and the challenges of regulating industries that are undergoing significant transformation. Since our last oversight hearing in 2015, FERC itself has also experienced a number of changes with addition of four new members, so I welcome all of you here today and look forward to hearing your individual perspectives on some very complicated and technical issues ranging from grid resilience to battery storage to cybersecurity. The past year has been challenging for the Commission, having struggled without a functioning quorum for more than six months. And during that period, utility filings became backlogged and decisions were delayed on matters ranging from utility rate applications to million dollar interstate natural gas pipeline proposals. Fortunately, I understand that FERC operations have returned to near normal, having cleared much of that backlog, allowing the Commission to turn its attention towards a host of issues ranging from controversial changes to the RTO capacity markets to how new energy infrastructure projects should be evaluated under FERC's certificate policy. As we recently heard at our hearing on energy infrastructure, building new pipelines and electric transmission towers is not an easy or simple task. Affected landowners know their rights and they have organized campaigns to oppose new energy projects, sometimes protesting at FERC's doorstep. I understand that Chairman McIntyre announced that the Commission is now taking a fresh look at its 1999 policy to evaluate the need for new natural gas pipelines. Obviously, a lot of changes have occurred over the last 20 years in the way infrastructure is developed, so I would be interested to hear what may come from that review. Another topic that has consumed much attention in the industry and at FERC recently involves the question of the bulk power system's ability to anticipate, withstand, and recover from disruptive events. This topic of grid resilience became a source of much heated debate, and we heard from Secretary Perry just last week that the national security of this country is jeopardized, those are his words, if we don't take steps to protect the grid. I understand that FERC has flagged as a top priority and has directed each of the RTOs and ISOs to provide detailed information regarding the state of grid resilience. The committee is reviewing the RTO submissions to FERC and will seek and track the anticipated responsive comments due early next month. FERC's jurisdictional electricity markets have also been a topic of frequent discussion during our Powering American hearing series. We've heard concerns from market participants that range from the need for updated PURPA regs to changes to FERC's transmission planning rules under Order 1000. Additionally, recent pricing proposals developed by the RTOs and ISOs aimed at accommodating state policies represent a fundamental shift in how resources set prices in the wholesale markets. Commissioner Lafleur deserves credit for focusing on that issue last May when she was chairman. But as these federal state jurisdictional issues play out in filings at FERC and in litigation at the various courts of appeals, we should consider the differences between and impacts of the wholesale and retail electricity mar markets. So these are tough issues, and I recognize that you've got a lot on your agenda right now. However, despite the tough work and challenging issues FERC faces, I'd like to point out that the Commission is consistently ranked among the best places to work in the federal government based on employee surveys. And your success in maintaining <coughs> such high marks by your 1,500 staff members is noted. With that, I want to thank the commissioners again for appearing today. And I look forward to your testimony and the questions and interaction that we have between us. With that, I recognize the ranking member of the Energy Subcommittee, Mr. Rush, my friend from Illinois. I certainly want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this very timely hearing uh, today. And I look forward to hearing from the FERC commissioners on some of the more pressing issues regarding the reliability and the resiliency of the uh, nation's electric grid. Mr. Chairman, just last week, this subcommittee heard from uh, Secretary Perry on what he considered a very real concern regarding 
we had reliability. Specifically, Mr. Chairman, the topic of NEOE potentially using its emergency authority under Section 202C of the Federal Power Act to grant the request made by First Energy to issue an emergency must-run order for 85 coal and nuclear plants within the PJM interconnection came up more than once. In fact, <coughs> Secretary Chair, uh, Perry, Mr. Chairman, seemed to be sounding the alarm that we are quickly heading toward a point of no return. When the imminent retirement of several coal and nuclear plants will leave our nation in a situation where we will be unable to meet our energy demands if we do not act soon. Mr. Chairman, I look forward to hearing the Commission's views on this critical issue. <clears throat> Another topic of great debate during last week's NOE hearing focused on the March 2018 study by the National Energy Technology Laboratory, or NETL. <clears throat> that report highlighted the use of coal during the prolonged coal snap that the nation experienced between December 2017 and January 2018. The NETL study concluded that within the PJ, PJM region, coal provided the most resilient form of generation during this coal blitz. It went on to say that without the available capacity from coal facilities, then PJM would have experienced power shortfalls and widespread blackout. However, Mr. Chairman, just this past Friday, PJM issued its own response to the NETL study, refuting those conclusions and stating that PJM indeed had adequate amounts of resources to supply power and did not need to invoke emergency procedures. PJM also noted that while coal and nuclear played an important role during this period, that was more due to economic factors and its reasons never faced any reliability threat. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> as the agency responsible for ensuring the reliability of the nation's electric grid, I look forward to hearing directly from the first commissioners on this and other important issues. Specifically, I would like to commend the agency for its recent unanimous vote finalizing a rulemaking allowing for aggregated distributive energy resources to compete in wholesale markets. This vote marked an important step in the right direction by allowing advanced technologies such as demand response, energy storage, electric automobiles, and solar <coughs> photovoltaics to participate in the wholesale market. Unfortunately, unfortunately Mr. Chairman, I also have some concerns regarding a recent study, uh, recent rather policy change determining how impacting stakeholders may intervene in pipeline reviews. I'd like to hear from the commission on this justification for a less lenient and allowing interveners to join proceedings that are, quote, out of time, and how these new changes might impact public input and participation in the pipeline review process. That said, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to the engaging the commission today and today, and I will yield back the balance of my time. Chairman yields back. Chair would recognize the chair of the full committee, gentleman from the good state of Oregon, Mr. Walden. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, good morning. Welcome to our FERC commissioners. Uh, we're delighted that you're here. I think the last time we had all the commissioners before the committee was in 2015. 
And so we're uh, delightful, uh, delighted that you're here. Uh, but this is the uh, first time under the chairmanship of Commissioner McIntyre. So uh, uh, we look forward to uh, the discussion um, that, that will take place. Uh, FERC oversees, as you all know, uh, many critical aspects of our nation's energy, energy infrastructure and industry. And uh, through the authorities provided by Congress, namely the Federal Power Act and the Natural Gas Act, the Commission regulates the interstate transmission of electricity, natural gas, and oil, and reviews proposals to build LNG terminals, interstate natural gas pipelines, and oversees the licensing of hydropower projects, all of which are very, very important to our country and to my state. Our nation's energy industry is at the forefront of an unprecedented period of change, driven in part by changes in fuel mixes, technological innovation, and market competition. Declining natural gas prices, stable demand, zero-cost generation resources, greater efficiency, they've all led to a generation mix differentiated not solely by cost, but through operational characteristics such as dispatchability, flexibility, and ramping. So a well-functioning energy system is dependent on competitive markets. However, in some wholesale electricity markets, certain generation resources such as coal and nuclear are struggling to recover costs and remain competitive. In some cases, under wholesale market rules, inflexible generation units are not permitted to set price. This presents real challenges for cost recovery, which could ultimately have an impact on the reliability and resiliency of our electricity grid. So I'm hopeful that FERC will take this matter seriously as it conducts its review of comments regarding resiliency in the organized electricity markets. At the same time, advances in digital and information technologies are driving real change creating new opportunities for more intelligent and dynamic energy systems. Many of these advanced te energy technologies have applications on the distribution side and beh behind the meter, beyond the regulatory reach of FERC. However, given the interconnected nature of our grid, we're beginning to see their impacts on the bulk power system and wholesale electricity markets. Of course, as our generation mix shifts toward natural gas, we're going to need more pipelines to transport gas from producing wells to end user consumers. New England's especially feeling that crunch, as we've heard, as we saw when they had to import LNG from Russia on two occasions this year to meet market demand. So I'm hopeful that Chairman McIntyre's review of FERC's procedures for evaluating applications for new gas pipelines will result in more efficient and timely decisions. I understand that FERC will be taking formal action on this review at its open meeting on Thursday. With our abundant shale resources, we can be entirely self-sufficient on natural gas, but we must construct new pipelines to do that. While cross-border trade with our neighbors in Canada and Mexico may be a win-win, we should never have to be reliant on the Russians for imports again. Since taking the gavel as chairman of this committee, I've made it my promise to always put the consumer first in everything that we do. The modern consumer expects greater control, convenience, and choice when it comes to their energy consumption. I'm excited about the changes taking place and the opportunities that it presents to our nation's economy and energy security. With that, I'd like to thank all of you for your willingness to participate in this public service and in this hearing, and I look forward to your testimony. Uh, as you all well know, we also have another subcommittee meeting at the same time on telecommunications issues, so you will have members, including myself, coming and going. But we really value your, your testimony and your long uh, public service, and we look forward to uh, a partnership together for America's future. With that, Mr. Chairman, I would yield back the balance of my time. Chairman yields back. Chair would recognize the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Plone from New Jersey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm pleased that there is finally a full slate of five commissioners at FERC. Last year, I voiced my concern that a lot of important work was put on hold for an extended period of time because the commission lacked a quorum. And it's a pleasure to have all five of you here with us today. First, I'd like to thank the Commission for its decision to reject Secretary Perry's notice of proposed rulemaking to provide cost recovery for certain coal and nuclear facilities that are no longer economical. This proposed rule was a threat to competitive electricity markets and would have led to higher energy prices for consumers. With Secretary Perry's proposed rulemaking now behind us, we must turn our attention to the feedback that the Commission receives from the regional transmission organizations as it relates to current resiliency risks. 
I would also like to touch briefly on FERC's authority to review applications for the construction of interstate natural gas pipelines. For years, I have expressed concern with the process FERC uses to review pipeline applications and its tendency to greenlight the construction of potentially unnecessary pipeline projects. Overbuilding our natural gas pipeline system has many negative impacts on the public. Ratepayers ultimately foot the bill for the construction of these pipelines, whether they're necessary or not. Homeowners in the path of a pipeline also have little recourse to stop pipeline companies from seizing their land through eminent domain. It's time for a new approach. I believe a more regional review of these projects should be implemented rather than the current process where every pipeline appears to be reviewed individually without any consideration of other pipelines in the area. And I was encouraged by Chairman McIntyre's announcement in December that FERC will review its 1999 pipeline policy statement. I hope this review leads to a new pipeline policy that provides greater protections to property owners and more holistic review process that looks at all pipelines in a given region. I've also heard from many property owners and advocacy groups that FERC is not nearly responsive enough to the public. More needs to be done at the Commission to provide a greater role for the general public in the FERC process. My colleague, Representative Schakowsky, has introduced a common sense bill that would create an office of public participation in consumer advocacy at FERC. And such an office would provide an important resource for everyday citizens who typically lack the ability to navigate the complex FERC process. And finally, I'd like to address FERC's grid storage order number 841, which was issued in February. I've long advocated for finding ways to introduce more distributed energy and energy storage into our electric grid and removing the many barriers preventing storage benefits from reaching consumers. So, so I'm fully aware that there are some technical changes that grid operators and utilities will have to overcome, but it can be done. And I'm pleased that FERC has directed the RTOs to evaluate how storage can add value to our electricity market. So again, uh, let me conclude by welcoming everyone here today. Thank you and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen's time has expired. We're now prepared to hear the testimony from each of the commissioners. We welcome you. Thank you for submitting your testimony in advance. It'll be made part of the record. We'll let you spend five minutes each uh, summarizing your statements, and at that point, we'll go to questions from both sides. So, Chairman McIntyre, welcome. Good to see you. Thank you, Chairman Upton. Likewise, thank you, and good morning, Chairman Upton, Ranking Member Rush, and distinguished members of this subcommittee. My name is Kevin McIntyre, and since December, I have had the privilege of ser serving as the chairman of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC. FERC is an independent federal agency that regulates important aspects of our nation's electric, natural gas, hydropower, and oil pipeline industries. As chairman, I am particularly pleased to be serving alongside my esteemed fellow commissioners who also are appearing before you today. I could not have hoped for a more engaged, better informed, and more public-spirited group of colleagues than these. My goals as chairman include the fostering of continued excellence at FERC, which was recently recognized, as you, Chairman Upton, mentioned, recognized in a prominent national ranking of the best places to work in the federal government as the number one mid-sized agency. My goals also include making FERC's actions as open, transparent, fair, and efficient as possible. A top substantive priority of mine is to protect and promote the resilience of our bulk power system, as has been mentioned here this morning. On January 8, we initiated a proceeding to evaluate the state of that grid resilience. We are still receiving the incoming public comments in response to our issuance in that proceeding. And as we are informed by those comments and deliberate on them, we will make determinations as to whether additional action by FERC is warranted in this critical area. I also am pleased that FERC is beginning a review of our 1999 policy statement on the certification, our term for the approval process, for interstate natural gas pipeline facilities. As a matter of good government, I believe that it is appropriate for us, as with any other governmental body, to review our policies and processes from time to time to, to explore whether any improvements can be made. Our review of gas pipeline certification processes is timely in light of the many changes that the natural gas industry has witnessed in the past 20 years. 
And in, these, in addition to these specific goals and priorities, as chairman, FERC is continuing to consider many other important issues. My fellow commissioners will address some of those in their testimony before you here this morning. With that, I thank you for this opportunity to be to appear before you. Thank you. Commissioner LaFleur, welcome. Thank you, Chairman Upton, Ranking Member Rush, and members of the subcommittee. <clears throat> My name is Cheryl LaFleur. I've been a commissioner at FERC for nearly eight years and have appeared before this committee several times. Got a little lonely last year, so I'm extremely happy to be here this morning with a full commission. Um, what I'm going to discuss today is FERC's regulation of, our, of wholesale electricity markets, and I'll also touch briefly on our oversight of interstate transmission planning. Both areas are covered more fully in my written testimony. The organized markets that provide electricity to more than two-thirds of Americans are roughly 20 years old now, and I believe they've done a very good job for the nation's electric customers, promoting efficiency and innovation, and protecting reliability at least cost by deploying resources over a broader regional footprint. As the committee knows, there are different market structures in different regions of the country, reflecting varied state and reason, regional regulatory choices. Perhaps the, perhaps the most prominent difference is that the eastern markets, PJM, New York ISO, and ISO New England, use mandatory capacity markets to ensure resource adequacy because all all or most of the states in those regions chose to deregulate generation in the 1990s. By contrast, the Midwestern and Western markets, MISO, SPP, and CAISO, rely primarily on state resource planning for resource adequacy. The markets have grown dramatically since I joined FERC in 2010. In 2013, the energy companies and others in the Mid-South became part of MISO, nearly doubling its size. Two years later, in 2015, the integrated systems and part of the Western Area Power Administration in the Upper Midwest joined SPP, marking the first time a federal power marketing administration chose to join a market. The big story in 2018 is the expansion of markets in the West. The Western Energy Imbalance Market, operated by the California ISO, has expanded in recent years to include utilities in five western states, including several public power entity, and now represents the load of 55% of the western interconnection. Several more entities are scheduled to join in the next two years when two-thirds of the electricity in the west will be shared and balanced by that market. In addition, a group of companies, primarily in Colorado and Wyoming, and are known as the Mountain West Transmission Group, have indicated their intent to join the Southwest Power Pool. I think it's really important that these market expansions are being driven at the state and regional and company level, not driven by FERC. In fact, I strongly believe that's the only reason they're happening, is that the choices are being made in the regions. They reflect the increasing and increasingly broad recognition that sharing resources over a large footprint can sustain reliability and should save money for customers, especially at a time of substantial resource change. FERC has worked hard to make sure the markets do what they're supposed to do. We've taken a number of steps to make sure that markets are fair for all resources, including emerging technologies. We've also worked to ensure grid resilience by overseeing capacity market changes to increase compensation to the resources, including base load, that keep the lights on at time of system stress. In the energy markets, we've taken a number of steps on market mechanics to improve price formation. The most challenging issue currently confronting the wholesale markets is their interplay with state policy initiatives, which my colleague, Mr. Powelson, will discuss and which I touch on in my testimony. Finally, I'll comment briefly on our work on interstate transmission. It's been nearly seven years since FERC issued order number 1000 to require regional transmission planning and cost allocation and require competitive transmission selection over some projects. Um, all regions of the nation are in some stage of implementing Order 1000 at this point. Five of them have had competitive transmission processes and have proven that it saves customers money. They've also proven that it's hard to do and that we have a lot more work to do on this, and it's something the Commission is going to continue to monitor and work on. And with that, I'll thank you again for the opportunity and look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you. 
Mr. Chatterley, welcome. Good to see you. Thank you. Great to see you, Chairman Upton, Ranking Member Rush, distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the important work FERC is doing to ensure that the American people have access to reliable and affordable energy. As a former congressional staffer, it's always a pleasure to be back on Capitol Hill. And I would like to note that while I came to the commission from the Senate, I began my career here in the People's House and never allowed myself to become a Senate snob. I can't say the same for all of my former colleagues. I appreciate the subcommittee's attention to the major energy issues facing our nation, as well as its interest in the role the commission plays in addressing them. I'd like to focus my remarks today on our efforts regarding reliability and the Public Utility Regulatory Policies Act of 1978, or PERPA, and to touch briefly on a few of my other priorities. I'll begin with a look at an area of energy policy affecting families and businesses across the nation on a daily basis, reliability. Congress delegated to FERC the responsibility to approve and enforce mandatory reliability standards for the grid, and with our partners at the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, we remain committed to that endeavor. Our reliability standards have progressed considerably since they first became mandatory and enforceable just over a decade ago. And today, they form an effective baseline for addressing day-to-day -day grid reliability issues like tree trimming, relay setting, communications, system planning, and emergency operations. Another way the Commission works to maintain reliability is through our oversight of jurisdictional wholesale energy, capacity, and ancillary services markets. For example, the Commission has recently taken a number of actions to ensure all new generators provide essential reliability services such as voltage and frequency control. Those efforts are a good start, but more work remains. Because of historically low natural gas prices and technological innovation, our country is experiencing rapid, unprecedented changes in its generation resource mix. These trends promise tremendous benefits to consumers through lower prices and greater choice, but they also highlight a need for vigilance as we ensure that reliability is not adversely impacted. I've been pleased to see the important work that ISO New England has done in this regard through its assessment of fuel supply vulnerabilities in its footprint. Its analysis is an ex excellent example of how RTOs and ISOs should proactively evaluate their specific regional risks. I expect that the implications of fuel security for grid reliability and resilience will continue to be areas of interest for the Commission. Finally, the Commission is also taking action to address other emerging threats, such as physical security, geomagnetic disturbances, and electromagnetic pulses. FERC and NERC have made important strides on these issues, and the Commission remains actively engaged with our government partners and other stakeholders to improve our knowledge of these threats and evaluate creative ways to address associated risks proactively. Now turning to the second topic I'd like to address, which is PERPA. Today's energy environment is fundamentally different from that of 1978 when PERPA was enacted. Because of this, many stakeholders are rightly asking whether changes to PERPA are needed to better align it with our modern energy landscape. While significant changes will require congressional action, I believe the Commission should review our existing regulations to ensure they fulfill purpose mandate of fostering the development of renewable and cogeneration resources while protecting customers and competition. Uh, before I close, I'd like to take a moment to touch on a couple of additional issues that I view as priorities. First, the Commission's current review of the 1999 Certificate Policy Statement. As FERC considers how we evaluate natural gas pipeline applications, I'm committed to ensuring that we have an efficient and transparent process that encourages landowner participation. From my perspective, our review should build upon our process improvement efforts under the recently signed MOU implementing Executive Order 13807, One Federal Decision Policy. Second, I'd like to emphasize my continued commitment to securing our grid against cyber attacks. While the administration has taken laudable steps already, I believe these challenges will continue to grow. I strongly support the Commission's approach to addressing cyber threats, which consists of mandatory standards as well as voluntary best practices and information sharing. Still, more work remains, and I look forward to continued cooperation with my colleagues at the Commission and our partners across the government. I want to take my final seconds to commend this committee in particular for the work that you guys have done to really look into these significant issues, not just by holding this hearing, uh, but Chairman Upton, under your leadership, the past couple of years, uh, this, this committee has done tremendous work to bring focus to these enormously complex issue areas. Um, 
as a, as a uh, alumnus of Congress, I believe firmly in the legislative branch's co-equal role in our government. And now having the good fortune uh, to serve the American public at the commission, uh, I've come to realize that in dealing with these enormous challenges, we are constrained by the statutes that govern us. But you all can take a, a, a leadership role in addressing some of these complex issues, and I look forward to working with you and your colleagues to do that in the future. Well, thanks for your kind words, and I know that uh, those are shared on both sides of the aisle, so appreciate that. Uh, Commissioner Paulson, welcome. Good morning, Chairman Upton, uh, Ranking Member Rush, and members of the subcommittee. I also want to echo what my colleagues had said earlier in thanking you for inviting us here this morning. Uh, my name is Robert Paulson. I'm honored to serve as a commissioner on the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. In fact, I was honored to go through the process with my colleague, uh, Commissioner Chatterjee. And uh, let me just say it's an honor to serve in this capacity. Before joining the commission um, in August, I spent nine years as a member of the Pennsylvania Public Utility Commission. I spent four and a half years as chairman. And I also served, I had the honor in 2017 of serving as president of the National Association of Regulatory Commissioners. So it's, when I look to my right and my left, the people I serve with here, it's a collegial body and the people that represent this agency are world-class as demonstrated in, in recent uh, rankings as a federal agency. My experience, Mr. Chairman, as a state regulator and my interaction with colleagues at the state commission level across the country have informed in my appreciation and understanding of the FERC's role uh, in interfacing with the states. Since joining the commission, I've approached each of my decisions with an understanding of how the determinations impact, as it was mentioned earlier, families and businesses nationwide. I've also prioritized my engagement with stakeholders from all backgrounds and geographic regions to ensure that I hear a variety of viewpoints and my decisions are fully informed. For purposes of my testimony here this morning, I'm focusing on two areas. First, I'll discuss the evolving grid and in particular how the nation's generation resource mix has changed in, in just the last uh, decade. The second issue is one of just a, a huge priority for all of us, and that's the proactive cybersecurity work that the FERC is doing. Now, when we talk about the changing electric grid, or some would call it the evolving grid, what's interesting is I, I look at my experience in Pennsylvania, where in 2008, most likely 50% of our dispatch was from coal. And now with the evolution of shale plays like Marcellus, Utica, and the plays in Louisiana and Texas and Arkansas, there has been a drastic shift in our power mix. And it's having a profound impact on wholesale power prices in a good way. It's actually in my home state has brought a $5 billion investment in an ethylene cracker to Beaver County, Pennsylvania. It's also changed at the local, we'll call burner tip, where customers, where gas purchase costs in LDCs across Pennsylvania, seven LDCs have dropped over 70%, a direct pass-through savings to customers um, in, in, in the states, uh, in, in the state of Pennsylvania. When we talk about the evolving grid, though, it's also important to mention the impact that new resources are having. As mentioned earlier uh, by Chairman uh, Walden, the, the evolution of the, um, uh, the, the evolution of battery storage, renewable energy, and the impact it's also having on the grid is critically important. You know, last year in our bulk power system, 10% of our dispatch power came from renewable energy resources. A number of states uh, over the last decade have adopted very successful renewable portfolio standards. I should note for my good friends from the Republic of Texas, uh, the state of Texas is the number one wind producer in the country. Shout out to Mr. Chairman Barton and Ranking Member uh, Olson as well. And uh, it speaks to the evolution again of our modern day grid. Now, another tectonic shift is also taking place in our grid. And unfortunately, it has to deal with the flat demand for electricity. As I like to say, the way we generate, transmit, and distribute power in this country is, is ever changing. The fact of the matter is the grid is getting more efficient, it's getting more resilient, and it's clearly getting cleaner. But 
we're also offering tools to customers. Those tools include things like energy efficiency, real-time pricing. As it mentioned earlier, in certain states like Texas and Pennsylvania and New Jersey, the ability to go out and shop for retail energy supply. And I note that because it, a lot of customers are out in the market, residential and uh, industrial customers. The last item I want to touch on is cybersecurity, and I think cyber is really one that uh, keeps us all up at night. And I'm just very proud of the work that this commission has done, um, going back to our former chairman, Commissioner LaFleur, in really working with the states, Mr. Chairman, to develop protocols and cyber capacities within the, the state public utility commissions. And I'll talk about that later on here in the hearing. Uh, there's been a number of changing threat vectors in the bulk power system. There are a number, as you know, a number of bad actors out there that want to infiltrate industrial control systems and wreak havoc on our bulk power system. But I'm proud to report again through the work of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, working with the Department of Homeland Security. More recently, the leadership demonstrated by Secretary Perry with the launch of the Office of Cybersecurity within the DOE is another great step forward in addressing uh, overall cybersecurity in this country. So, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to today's conversation and appreciate the opportunity to be with you and your colleagues. Thank you. Commissioner Glick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you, uh, Ranking Member Rush and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify this morning. As a former minority general counsel to the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee, and I will say maybe I'm a snob according to Commissioner Chatterjee, but um, as, as a former counsel of the committee, it's nice to be back on Capitol Hill, and it's good to see some familiar faces from the joint House and Senate Energy Bill conference that took place during the last conference. I've been a member of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission for almost five months. During this short period of time, the commission has call, been called upon to consider a number of challenging matters. Although FERC is not typically an agency that receives a substantial amount of public attention, the commission's actions have a significant impact on the lives of everyday Americans. I witnessed this firsthand while at the Department of Energy at the end of the Clinton administration. The Commission's inability to come together on a unified response during the height of the Western energy crisis in, in 2000 caused consumers to pay significantly more for electricity and natural gas than they should have. It is imperative that the five of us safeguard, work together to safeguard the public's interest. As everyone here knows, we are in the midst of a dramatic transformation in the ways Americans produce and consume energy. This revolution has the potential to substantially improve our energy efficiency, reduce emissions, grow the economy, and create millions of new jobs. FERC can help facilitate this transition by removing the barriers to participation and competition that exist in the wholesale markets. For instance, the Commission can examine market rules to ensure that they are not unduly discriminating against new technologies. In February, FERC voted 5-0 to approve a final rule requiring RTOs and ISOs to facilitate energy storage participation in wholesale electric markets. Storage technologies such as batteries and pumped hydro have the potential to play a leading role in the transition to the electricity system of the future. As the cost of energy storage continues to decline, these resources are poised to become a bigger part of the generation mix, leading to the development of a more robust grid that can, among other things, help to accommodate the ever-increasing demand for clean, renewable resources from states, corporation, and residential customers. In, the, in addition, these storage resources will enhance the reliability and resilience of the grid while also reducing electric rates. Today, the cost of using lithium-ion battery technology is less than one quarter of what it was at the start of the decade. Partly as a result of those declining costs, industry forecasts project that the nation's installed energy storage capacity will increase by 750 percent in just five years. The Commission's action to reduce barriers to help storage, to, uh, the Commission to reduce barriers to energy storage resource participation in wholesale markets will help to further this remarkable trajectory all the while reducing consumer energy bills. I believe FERC, pursuant to the Federal Power Act, should also identify and eliminate other barriers to the participation of new energy technologies in wholesale markets. For example, the Commission last week held a technical conference in, uh, to examine the potential participation of aggregated distributed energy resources in wholesale markets and the benefits these resources could provide. Chairman Upton and Ranking Member Rush, thank you again for the opportunity to, befear, to appear before the committee today. I look forward to answering your questions and the questions of your colleagues. Well, thank you all. Appreciate you, you being here. And I, and the, the first thing that I want to raise, I don't know if you saw uh, today's uh, Washington Post, 
this is a, a copy of it. I should have made copies for you, but it's uh, it's entitled the, the headline is U.S. British governments warn businesses worldwide of Russian campaign to hack routers, and it quotes the uh, Homeland Security Assistant Secretary for Cybersecurity, and she says, "Once you own the router, you own the traffic that's tra traversing the router," uh, and it's pretty clear. In the story, it starts off, the U.S. and British governments on Monday accused Russia of conducting a massive campaign to compromise computer routers and firewalls around the world from home offices to internet providers for espionage and possible sabotage purposes. And as you may know, we're planning to mark up tomorrow uh, a bill that's gonna, gonna help coordinate things uh, with the Department uh, of Energy that I believe, at least at this point, looks to have pretty widespread bipartisan support uh, by virtually all of the members of this subcommittee is what I'm told in advance, but you know, you gotta wait till you get there. Um, so Chairman McIntyre, my question is, it's my understanding that DOE has offered an open invitation for FERC commissioners to receive intelligence briefings on cyber-related threats. Uh, and I'm curious to know how many of, uh, of you, how many of those of you might have taken up with uh, you and, and your fellow commissioners in terms of the, the briefings that have been offered? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I don't know the exact number. Obviously, this is an open setting, so I caution everyone in terms of what they might say. Yes, sir. But let me just note up front that the issue that you've raised here, it would be we would be hard pressed to identify one of greater concern to us as an energy industry, as regulators of that industry, and indeed as as a nation in terms of national security, than this threat of cyber attacks from bad actors in many cases state actors such as you have identified. We are increasingly working with DOE and other components of the federal government on a daily basis, mostly at the staff level, Mr. Chairman, to ensure that we stay on top of these issues and take all appropriate measures that are available to us. And I know that the staff of each and every one of my colleagues here has been very much engaged in that process. You're correct that we've been offered personal briefings that, that we are, I think, in the process of scheduling and taking. Very, very helpful. The DOE has been very helpful in this regard, DHS, TSA, and our level of engagement on this, I think, will only continue to increase. Do you believe that there's any additional statutory authority that FERC may need uh, as you look to the future? Well, that's a good question. In 2005, we were given the role of ensuring that reliability is attended to through our oversight of the electric reliability organization of the nation and the reliability standards promulgated by it. Uh, and I believe that we are making good use of that authority. I don't have a specific area right now that, that I can identify as something where we would, we would need broader statutory authority. I am very pleased with this level of increased federal engagement that I described. My colleagues may wish to add their own. Yeah, comments. and maybe also, can you shed any any uh, light on the degree and frequency of cyber attacks on, on the energy infrastructure? Attacks are constant, but the degree of severity and from the perspective of the perpetrators, success, that is what varies. But every day, not just governmental entities, but indeed the companies that we regulate are subject to attacks and attempted attacks. Yeah, I'd, I'd appreciate hearing from the other commissioners as well. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think uh, in terms of the interactions that we've had with DOE and other agencies, um, I had the good fortune to represent the commission at an ESCC electric sector coordinating council meeting um, with a number of stakeholders across the government and industry looking at these serious issues. Um, I also got to uh, participate in a delegation that included DOE, uh, DHS, uh, uh, and FERC uh, that traveled to Israel to, uh, to learn about best practices and ways to stay ahead of these ever-evolving threats. It's something that I think my colleagues and I all take very seriously. It is the new reality that we must contend with as we benefit and gain from the technological innovation that's taking place in this space, we have to be cognizant that it comes with that downside risk of increased cyber vulnerability, and uh, uh, my colleagues and I will all remain vigilant on this. Commissioner LaFleur. Oh, thank you, Chairman. I, I've received a number of briefings, um, classified briefings at the Department of Energy over the years. I actually have one scheduled tomorrow, and I appreciate Secretary Perry continuing to make them available. 
in answer to your other question, uh, hacks on the grid are constant. The, uh, the, the National Center for Cybersecurity and Communications Integration, whatever NKIC stands for, um, every year electric grid attacks are either a slight majority or slightly below 50% in the public numbers they put out every year. Fortunately, in part because of the strong standards that I believe we put in place for the high voltage electric grid on perimeter security and password security and other things, they're infrequently successful, very, very infrequently successful with the electric grid. In terms of what this committee has done, um, I think this committee has done an excellent job on the electric grid side. I used to participate when I was chairman in some kind of committee that was across government of heads of the different agencies. And I think where there's more we can do is across the different infrastructure sectors, among electricity, water, gas, finance, and others. That's where there's real, I think, weaknesses in sharing information and learning from each other because they're all quite... They're looked at individually on the Hill and in government, but we all have a lot we have in common. Go ahead. Mr. Chairman, let me also pick up on that. The outreach that the FERC has done through our Office of Energy Infrastructure and Security, outreaching to state public utility commissions and helping state PUCs build their internal capacities to address cyber. I'm very proud of the work that um, our Office of Electric, our Energy Infrastructure and Security, along with our Office of Electric Reliability, State public utility commissions have used us as a resource uh, to go through trainings and we've developed this checklist that uh, PUCs can use with their regulated utilities to help uh, in a management audit. It's been a great collaborative. I will tell you it's very difficult when you asked about resources. We could certainly use more boots on the ground. Um, I'm not here to get ahead of my chairman on that, but I'll make the uh, request. Uh, <laughs> The, the work getting out to 50 states and doing that kind of trading uh, requires a lot of boots on the ground. The good news is we're doing it in a collaborative approach with NARUC. Commissioners have come into Washington for read-ins. These are all good things that are evolving, but to the earlier points, these threat vectors are changing every day. And working, um, trying to break down the silo mentalities between the different federal agencies, I think we've come a long way in the last eight years as a nation to address these, these emerging threats. Thank you, I know my time has expired, so I'll yield to Mr. Rush. Mr. Chairman, uh, Chairman McIntyre, back in January, the commission voted unanimously to reject Secretary Perry's notice of proposed rulemaking that sought to prop up coal and nuclear facilities. Instead, the commission ordered grid operators to submit additional information regarding their ability to judge, and I quote you, naturally occurring and man-made threats, end quote, to their system within 60 days. Where does the agency currently stand on this issue? Uh, does the commission believe that we're truly heading past the point of no return when the retirement of coal and nuclear facilities will leave us in a situation where we will soon be unable to meet our energy demands if we do not act quickly? Does the agency support uh, action by state, states, the RTOs, uh, the markets, or the Congress? Or does, it, does the commission have the means and the authority to act on this issue if and when uh, it becomes a problem? Well, thank you for the question, Ranking Member Rush, and also thank you for acknowledging the steps that we as a commission have taken thus far. As you note, our January order did raise the issue of grid grid resilience and specifically in terms of steps forward, we directed our nation's operators of our, of our regional grids, the regional transmission organizations and independent system operators to take the first step in helping us to build our record on which we would base our decision making by submitting to us their own perspectives on resilience within their respective footprints. 
And those, those, that initial round of comment has come in from the regional transmission organizations and independent system operators. Now we're in the subsequent commenting phase. The questions you raise are among the very important issues that we will have to grapple with. Are there categories of resources, or indeed even perhaps specific important resources, that if they were to retire on a permanent basis, simply go away and exit the scene of resources that are available to contribute to the energy that serves our nation's energy needs, would that be something that would be harmful, harmful to American interests? Very important issue and a tricky one. So that is very much within the scope of the matters that we will be looking at as we make our decisions going forward. I would like to ask uh, any of the other commissioners, would you care to comment on my question? Well, I think broadly the commission has two major sets of our responsibilities that really are directed to the resilience of the electric grid. The first is the market rules to make sure that um, there's enough resources in the market, that there's enough of the type of resources that are needed to keep the lights on at any given time, and that they're properly paid and the markets are stable so they'll continue to attract investment and resources. Secondly, um, the Commission has put in place a number of broad standards, both the reliability standards we oversee, as well as some of the rules that Commissioner Chatterjee referred to, for example, on frequency response or voltage, to make sure that if there's an essential reliability services that's in demand because of all the changes on the grid, we have it for customers. Um, I think that Chairman McIntyre really covered very well the ongoing resilience proceeding. In terms of specific resources that are needed, all of the market operators have in place reliability must run tariffs. So if a resource wants to retire, a test is done to make sure that its retirement will not put customer reliability at risk. If there are changes needed in those tariffs, we'll look at them, but I think that's a good place to start. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ranking Member. Um, I initially uh, was sympathetic uh, when Secretary Perry proposed the uh, Notice of Proposed Rulemaking to the Commission. Um, uh, being from Kentucky, having worked for Leader McConnell, I saw firsthand the devastating impact that coal plant shutdowns had on coal communities throughout Appalachia. I also believe in climate change and man's role in it and believe that we need to mitigate emissions and uh, believe nuclear power will play an essential role in that. Um, and, uh, and also am cognizant of the security concerns that Secretary Perry himself laid out before this uh, uh, committee last week. That said, none of those issues were relevant to the docket that was before us. And I agreed with all of my colleagues in, in voting to reject it because the record simply did not support compensating plants based on uh, the, the availability of 90-day supply of fuel. That doesn't mean that Secretary Perry didn't ask the right question. And I do believe uh, the question of resilience that we are examining in this, uh, this, this current docket um, is an essential one. And, and I think over the course of time, uh, Secretary Perry will be proven right. We are going to ultimately have uh, resilience challenges in this country, and we need to be prepared for that, and I think that this docket will allow for that. Um, finally, I will say, um, to build on the point that, uh, that Commissioner uh, LaFleur made about you know, existing tariffs for, for reliability must runs, um, we've got to evaluate whether, whether they work or not. You know, while Secretary Perry asked the right question, perhaps the NOPR was not the right solution, there may be other necessary solutions, and we may in the coming days, weeks, months, be confronted with situations where the existing tariffs do not uh, uh, allow for you know, some of the accommodations that may be necessary. I had pushed for a show cause order that I included in my concurrence to the NOPR that I think as we look back in time uh, may have been uh, the right thing to do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You may. Thank you. Mr. Barton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to ask my questions uh, directly to the chairman, but if any of the commissioners wish to uh, add their comments, they're very welcome to. My first question, Mr. Chairman, is uh, can you give the subcommittee uh, a general idea of what the variance is in retail cost of electricity in this country is by region from, say, the lowest region to the highest region? Thank you for the question, Congressman. 
No, I'm afraid I don't actually have that information at hand. It does vary very much by region, and that in turn is often a function of the fuel type that is generally consumed within that region. Does anybody on the, yes, sir, Mr. Um, Powelson. This is uh, not real time, Mr. Chairman, but I don't, I don't need down you, to the okay. exact. So let's start with probably the highest distribution rate in the country is at about 43 cents a kilowatt hour in the island of Hawaii. And we go more inland to the lowest cost of energy. Uh, I think the Republic of Texas, through retail competition, customers are paying less for power today than they were prior to electric restructuring. So Texas has low rates. Uh, the state of Florida, for my last anecdotal meeting with officials from their utility, a nine cent kilowatt at, per kilowatt hour all in price. That's transmission, distribution, and generation. So you, you, you go from Hawaii, we know, at 43 cents to your state, maybe Florida, at a low distribution rate of nine cents. Well, let's exclude Hawaii since they're 3,000 miles from the mainland. Is it, is it fair to say that um, in the lower 48, the, the price difference at retail, uh, the highest would be three times the lowest. Is that a fair generalization? I know I'm close. The, the, the right answer would be to say yes, but if you disagree with me. I don't want to get ahead of my chairman, so. I mean, it's at least two to one, and, and, and I think if you, if you look at California, if you compare California to Oregon, uh, you're going to have, it's going to be close to three to one. Or if you compare Texas to New York, it's going to be close to three to one. Would y'all agree with that? Now, the reason I ask that question is because ultimately what the committee and the Congress and the president are responsible for is, is uh, for lack of a better term, retail electricity prices that, that, that the average citizen uh, can pay. We also want it to be reliable. And we've developed a mix of energy sources in this country. Uh, you know, some states have regulated markets, some states have deregulated markets, some states pretty much rely on coal, some states have a, like Texas, we've got a mix of, 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 of coal, natural gas, uh, wind, uh, and, and, and some, some nuclear power, and a little solar power. Um, but our, our nuclear plants and our coal plants are in distress. And my second question, is the distress primarily caused by market forces, natural gas prices being very low, uh, or is it caused by regulatory uh, constraints on the nuclear industry and the coal industry? Congressman, I'll begin. Thank you for the question. Certainly, the low prices of natural gas today that we experience in this country, due in large measure to the revolution in natural gas production methods, make for significant headwinds wins for coal and nuclear because it's very, very difficult for them to compete in our open and competitive wholesale markets against that cheap natural gas resource. As to the regulatory role, hard to say. Certainly nuclear compliance and everything associated with the prospect of building a new nuclear generating facility today makes for enormous cost. That probably has an all but prohibitive effect at short-term competition with natural gas prices. My time's about to expire. Yes, sir. I asked the first question to, to bring to the attention of the commission and the committee that retail prices vary greatly in this country. The cost of generation of electricity uh, varies depending on the fuel source. And the, the regulatory burden, obviously, on, on nuclear is very high. And you can argue that it's also very high on coal plants. If we look for solutions to keep our distressed nuclear plants and coal plants in service, we should first look at regulatory relief and only then look at market relief. When you start, in my opinion, to mess with the market, which some of these proposals do, in the long run, it hurts the consumer because you either have to subsidize that price, uh, which drives the 
retail price up, um, and eventually you can't you can't sustain it. So, I respect my good friend at the Department of Energy, Governor Perry, um, but I don't think his proposed solution, while it's well-meaning, I personally don't think it would work in the long run. I would encourage the commission, to the extent you can, to look on the regulatory relief side, you know, before we begin to look at market market solutions. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Chairman yields back. Mr. Pallone. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In my opening statement, I noted that I have long advocated for finding ways to introduce more distributed energy and energy storage into our electricity grid. And one of the reasons for that is that I see too many transmission projects needlessly rubber stamped in the name of reliability. There are certainly other ways to address reliability than just gold plating the transmission system. But perhaps when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So today, newer and bigger transmission lines aren't always the answer to the question of reliability. Distributed energy resources, renewable and otherwise, along with efficiency and demand response, should be equally large tools in the box. And technology has dramatically transformed the possibilities for cost-effective generating and efficiently delivering electricity to homes, businesses, and manufacturing facilities from a variety of sources. So I want to commend the Commission for recognizing this with its recent order regarding storage. But storage and distributed generation, both fossil and renewable based, along with improving storage options, smart meters, microgrids, and other technologies, have altered the possibilities for effectively and economically ensuring reliability. And these technologies have also called into question the most basic tenets of rate making and have challenged the longstanding financial model for utilities. Now, two years ago, I want to talk about a local issue. Two years ago, First Energy, JCPNL, determined that its Monmouth County, where I live, that its Monmouth County reliability project was necessary to retain reliability for the entire regional transmission grid, and specifically for New Jersey. And they proposed a 10-mile transmission line that would run through the district I represent along New Jersey Transit's North Jersey coastline. Ever since JCPNL proposed this project, I've articulated concerns about whether constructing this Monmouth uh, County reliability project is necessary to accomplish JCPNL's stated reliability goals. Recently, this view was echoed by New Jersey Administrative Law Judge Gail Cookson, who ruled that JCPNL failed to demonstrate that the transmission line is necessary and noted that JCPNL has not seriously considered alternative corridors and ignored non transmission solutions entirely. In the past, building a new transmission line may have been the only way to increase reliability. However, now there clearly are other options available. Other options include distributing, distributed generation, storage, various new grid technologies. Uh, they can only not only increase reliability, but also modernize the grid. So um, this Judge Cookson's decision, which you know, I'll, I'll send to you, and I'm going to you know, probably get back to you further if that's OK on this. But her decision supports my long-held suspicion that often projects like this Monmouth County reliability project or more about the rate of return for shareholders and reliability for consumers. So my question uh, to all of you is, whoever wants to ask it, how can we change this dynamic to ensure that utilities look at more than just new transmission lines, that they look at non-transmission alternatives to ensure reliability? And how can we change incentives so that these non-transmission alternatives are still financially attractive to utilities? Would anybody, you know, take a guess? Sure. Um, can I? Uh, Congressman Pallone, your home state, uh, working with your state BPU, and we're seeing it across other states like New York with their reinventing the energy vision in Ohio, their power forward docket, is to, to address exactly your point, getting at these non-wire solutions that we're seeing now with a, customer, a greater uh, customer engagement behind the meter. Your state is, is a leader in that because of the lessons learned in the post-Hurricane Sandy where a grid resiliency bank has been launched under the BPU's leadership, a lot of microgrid investment in your home state. And these are all good outcomes. It goes back to my earlier point of this evolving grid. We're not building 1,200 megawatt cathedrals anymore. We're doing things behind the meter and, yes, in front of the meter, cleaner, more efficient. Um, but can, per, can, I mean, can FERC play a role in this, though? Because everybody says, oh, right. it's, what's well, the federal government going to do? To the wholesale piece, and this is just my quick observation, we're finding in certain jurisdictions where, one, there is a lack in the post-FERC Order 1000 world of not really seeing competitive transmission being built, and that's, that's, uh, that's a PJM problem. The other thing is 
uh, addressing cost caps associated with these projects. Um, I have a concern when industrial customers come in to the commission as energy users telling us that they're seeing a 400% increase in transmission costs as wholesale prices are dropping. That's alarming. That tells me that the RTOs at the wholesale level of transmission planning are not doing a very good job with cost containment. And we are all paying for that as consumers. So these are the things that I plan to work on with my colleagues, and I know Commissioner LaFleur wants to jump in on that. Um, well, just adding to that, um, first of all, legally, the transmission planning tariffs that First Energy and others live within require trans consideration of non-transmission alternatives. That is what's legally supposed to happen. I think the problem is sometimes that um, it's more difficult to see the company making money from some of the non-transmission alternatives. That's where things like our storage rule comes in to make sure that those things are fairly paid for. And also the work, I was in New Jersey um, on Friday at an all-day meeting on New Jersey's energy future and the work that's being done at the state level to make sure those technologies are rewarded so that everyone has an incentive to install them, like the wonderful work you've done on solar already, where New Jersey's a leader. Um, I also think that the we've done a lot of work on the planning processes to make sure that um, a company can't just go off and plan something. There has to be an open process. We issued an order last month uh, about supplemental transmission projects in PJM requiring more sunlight in the planning to make sure that all the alternatives were considered, including by consumer reps and state representatives and others. And those are some of the kind of detail things we can do to make sure that the process doesn't ineluctably force in a certain direction. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could, I don't know if we're out of time, but I'd like to be able to get back to them further on this with your permission. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, perhaps, I don't know, written questions and written yeah. answers? Is that right? Would, is that okay? Great. Thank, thank you. Good. Yes. Mr. Olson. I thank the Chair and welcome to our friends at FERC. I want to discuss pipelines and the MLPs that many companies use to finance getting steel in the ground. None of the things we talk about today, whether it's gas turbines or exports of liquefied natural gas, can happen without pipelines. And this is not the Ways and Means Committee, and nor do I ever want to be a tax litigator or a tax legislative person. I've heard from a number of Houston area companies that are worried about a change that FERC did on whether pipelines can recover their costs under MLP uh, structures. Companies like Enbridge, Enbridge, whose merged with Spectra said, I quote, they intend to ask for rehearing of this policy change at FERC, end quote. Their argument is that FERC made this move without allowing enough time for debate and y'all didn't take into account that not all MLPs are created equal. Chairman McIntyre, welcome. Can you talk about this ruling? We you think your approach was appropriate? Yes, Congressman, happy to address that. The, the rule you referenced is actually, it was a series of steps we took in response to a Court of Appeals case called SFPP. And we, we had before us fairly clear direction from the Court of Appeals to address the so-called double recovery issue of taxation. We felt we had no choice but to take decisive action in a manner that we read as being directed by the court. It doesn't surprise me that a number of companies out there affected adversely monetarily by that would have a quarrel with it, and they are not bashful in sharing their views with us on that, I assure you. Their they texts, have, we aren't bashful at all. <laughs> perfectly legitimate. And it, it is their right under the governing statutes to seek rehearing where they are aggrieved by an order of ours. And so we will look forward to processing those in accordance with our law and procedures. Thank you. And Commissioner Chatterjee, put in your house thinking hat on, any thoughts about the situation with the MLPs and the change in law? Uh, yes, sir. Um, I agree uh, substantively that the, the chairman is correct that our hands were tied by the courts. Um, 
coming from the legislative branch, you know, we focus a lot on process. And I think, look, I'm new to the commission. Four of the five of us are new to the commission. Um, I'm not afraid to say that, you know, we're all still learning and progressing. And procedurally, I do now recognize and looking back that perhaps there were some things that we could have done differently. Um, for instance, voting during the market day um, was perhaps unfortunate. I think we incorrectly assumed once we posted our Sunshine Act notice that that was enough of a sort of disclaimer that this was coming and that the markets would factor that in. Clearly, that was a misread. Um, I'm, I'm sympathetic to the argument that beyond an NOI process that took place uh, a, a couple, you know, in the past, maybe a technical conference, some more process, you know, could have been necessary. And so um, uh, I'm always learning and, and trying to do my job better, and uh, we'll try and learn from this experience as well going Thank forward. Thank you. That's a man of the house. My final question is, you all know I am not shy about supporting LNG exports. In fact, I was in India two weeks ago. I left there being, they call me the congressman for LNG exports from America. I spoke to Secretary Perry last week about how important these exports are to Texas, our country, and our world. Despite that, I've heard some concerns back home that you are slipping behind schedules of some very viable Gulf Coast LNG projects. I've heard rumors that FERC has only six to eight employees targeted with approving these booming permits. I've heard you actually approach the DOE for new members to help out with the backlog of approving LNG permits. Um, to the whole panel, or the chairman, is that true? And how can we help you get these things rolling as quickly as possible? Thank you for the question, Congressman. We are paying very close attention to the pending applications, not only for LNG export infrastructure, but also for natural gas pipeline infrastructure. It's consuming an enormous amount of attention and manpower within the agency. We are looking to beef up the ranks of our Office of Energy Projects, and we are actively pursuing hiring in that regard right now. But this, if there's any suggestion that we are somehow not giving it our full effort right now, I can assure you that that is not, not the case at all. It's consuming a huge amount of attention and effort and, and energy right now. Thank you. Mr. Paulson, quick question. Can you say y'all? Uh, y'all. There you go. Welcome to Texas. Yeah, you know, my time is expired. Gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney. I thank the chair and I thank the commission and uh, your, uh, your opening statements were, were uh, interesting and useful. It's good to see a, uh, a, a body working together like this, and I appreciate that. Um, a little last year, we narrowly dodged a bullet at the Oroville Dam when a section of the emergency spillway collapsed. Uh, evacuation over 100,000 people was ordered, and there was considerable damage to the dam, associated structures, the river, and many downstream communities. In January of this year, a FERC required independent forensic team issued their report on the Oroville incident, and the report is not flattering at all to the agencies responsible for the dam uh, safety. So I'll, I'm going to read a, a, a summary of the report. Although the practice of dam safety has certainly improved since the 1970s, the fact that this incident happened to the owner of the tallest dam in the United States under regulation of a federal agency with repeated evaluation by reputed outside consultants in a state with leading dam safety regulatory program is a wake-up call for everyone involved in dam safety. Challenging current assumptions on what constitutes best practice in our industry is overdue. So that's the quotation from the report. Uh, so this calls into question the adequacy of the FERC Part 12D regulatory uh, for ensuring comprehensive reviews of dam designs and construction. Uh, Mr. Chairman, is the Commission planning to revise Part 12D regulations to improve the inspection process? Thank you for the question, Congressman. We don't have a specific plan to address the 12D regulation process right now. I certainly acknowledge the importance of the issues you raised, and in fact, it wasn't only em the emergency spillway, but indeed the main spillway right. that was very much called into question, the, the integrity of that. Our Office of Energy Projects is working literally daily hand in hand with the appropriate California authorities to ensure that the remediation process is completed 
in an appropriate fashion so there's complete safety all around. And my understanding, based on conversations as recently as yesterday, is that that is, that that is from our perspective, going very well, and that all involved in the, on the Orville end are doing their job very well. And okay, is the commission reconsidering its policies with respect to the ways in which information submitted by participants of, to the license process that specifically deal with questions of safety, will that be evaluated? Yes, I can tell you that that will be a matter of internal deliberation and whether that proceeds to any formal commission action is something that I can't say right now. I do know my colleague, Commissioner LaFleur, may want to chime in here. Yeah, well, I was at the commission and chairman when Oroville happened and spent some time out at the dam and it was really an extraordinary event. We were very fortunate not to have had loss of life um, when the spillway ruptured. Um, we really have been responding on three levels. Um, the, and the first is the actual facility itself, closely working with the Division of Water Resources and the California agencies. We've had people on site ever since that happened, 24 seven for several months, to make sure they do what they need to do over a two year period to correct that. And of course, the light relicensing is pending as well, which we can't talk about, but that these issues are being brought in there. Secondly, looking at other spillways of common construction in California, there were several and elsewhere to make sure they're all closely inspected and we directly learned the lessons of the forensics panel that you mentioned. And third is our own safety program. And in addition to the forensics panel that you mentioned, um, we also set up a team um, of outside people to look at how we do our inspections. And we're waiting for their report and we'll be um, taking action just as you suggested. Okay, to change the gears a little bit here. Are we, exp we are experiencing more extreme weather events. What steps is FERC taking to ensure the resiliency of the grid? Again, Mr. Chairman. Well, we are in the process of doing the comment intake I referenced earlier on our grid resilience proceeding. The recent extreme weather events have been instructive in this regard, and it's varied by region, but certainly just to pick a region in New England, it was particularly challenging, this bomb cyclone event over the passage of last year into this year, where increasing amounts of oil generating resources or oil fire generating resource, resources were needed to be called upon in, or, in order to ensure the electricity needs of that region, triggering, of course, not only environmental concerns, but significant cost increases. So these weather events are directly tied to our statutory obligation to ensure that the rates are just and reasonable and also directly tied to our need to ensure the reliability of our bulk power system. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, are you back? Gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shimkus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's great to have you all here today. Thank you for coming. And uh, you've got a big portfolio of things that you deal with. I'm going to stay on the electricity side, but I just want to mention that um, New England, the Northeast, needs more natural gas pipelines. Just, you know, especially with, uh, you know, home heating oil and stuff like that. We, we just got to, that's why you're empowered to help resolve the difficulties of crossing state lines and, and siding and that stuff because it just, just needs to happen. Let me move to uh, the, uh, obviously, part of your uh, mission statement is regulates the transmission and wholesale sales of electricity in interstate commerce. So the first one is hopefully to you all, um, is with uh, states intervening to some extent in wholesale market support to generation. How are you handling that? I mean, what, what, what's, um, that kind of addresses a couple things, reliability, possibly, uh, if you're trying to ensure low cost, reasonable prices in the wholesale sector, they, they, the, the two issues kind of conflict, do they not? And if relatively quickly, because I want to go down on a couple of other questions. Well, you've gone directly to one of the trickiest areas that we deal with, Congressman. The states have their valid role in making policy choices as to energy resources that are preferred by that state, and they reflect that through their legal decision making. We have an obligation at the FERC level to ensure that the electricity generated by those resources that makes it its way onto our grid is sold at rates that are just and reasonable. 
the costs behind that generation now are affected by the resource policy choices. So we have to be respectful of the state's roles while ensuring that we do our federal role right of ensuring just and reasonable rates. So does everyone quickly agree with that analysis? Mr. Shimkus, if I, if I could just um, put in here for a second. I, I think that it, it, it's true that, that we actually have to do a balancing, but the Federal Power Act gave the states the authority over resource decision making, not the generation resource decision making, not the FERC. And so I think it's up to the commission within our responsibilities to ensure that rates are just and reasonable, wholesale rates are just and reasonable, and also that the markets are, are, are reliable but to accommodate those state policies, not to override those state policies. And I think that's an important objective, it's an important objective for us. Go ahead, chime in. I support states' rights. I, you, I testified to that, I think. <laughs> I, I come from a market state now, recognizing there's regional differences in these markets, as Commissioner LaFleur mentioned. Some markets have capacity, some are energy only. But I'm having an epiphany now as a new FERC commissioner States are clearly, to my colleague's point, are allowed to design things like renewable portfolio standards. But what's happening, Congressman, is we are creating, we are bastardizing these markets in such a way where the states are picking winners and losers. They're allowed to do that. But now it's coming at the consequences of the capacity market construct. And let me just say, Secretary Perry was right. That con these constructs are bastardizing these markets and the availability of generators to receive adequate compensation for that resource. And so I might be Debbie Downer here in my approach, but it is a concern that we have to be cognizant of to the point of giving states flexibility, I will say within reason of the Federal Power Act. Okay, let me throw another one. And I'm sorry to not go to, to Commissioner of the floor, but um, RTOs and ISOs are struggling to find consensus to drive the needed investments that we say they all need. Um, what can you all do about that? So if we need, see, I, I've been in this on the committee for a long time, so I understand when we had regulated markets and we went to competition and now we're schizophrenic. Some regulated, some comp competition, uh, transmission going across state lines. I think we need to continue for reliability uh, is to make sure that we have needed pathways, but we're being told we can't fund them. Do you have a role? Is there something you can do to help in the process of the uh, uh, build out? In terms of transmission? Yes. Congressman? Yes, well, uh, uh, Commissioner LaFleur mentioned the importance of attention to our transmission planning processes. I think that's something that is ripe for evaluation as to whether it's working as well as it should, as well as was, as was hoped for when we issued our landmark Order 1000. I think it's a valid question that does indeed cry out for attention. Okay, my, if anyone wants to jump in, my time's expired, but I, go ahead. Um, I just add quickly, sure. I, you know, as you know, as you worked on this, in the 2005 Energy Policy Act added a provision that had provided incentives or, or allowed FERC to provide incentives for transmission. And I think it's a good, a good time maybe to now to revisit that policy and are we really incenting what we need to do? Are we incenting the right investments? And, and, and are we incenting the actual investments that are needed? And so I, I would, I would that, that's what I would look at first is, is the uh, incentives for transmission. Yeah, my time's ex uh, expired. I would just say if we ever move on infrastructure, expansion of the transmission grid might be a good thing to put an in infrastructure package to. And I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Green. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and uh, uh, since our uh, commissioner talked about the Republic of Texas, being a Texan and I have the Houston area, and, and if you look at your maps on pipelines, you don't see anything. There may be white in other parts of the country, but in my area in Southeast Texas, pipelines are the way we move product and crude oil to come in or natural gas to come in to make uh, chemicals out of it. Um, Texas was an independent nation for 10 years, and uh, some of us still think we should be, but uh, um, we lost that battle in 1865 too. But uh, we got a pretty good deal in Texas. We uh, uh, the federal government in 1845 paid off our $10 billion, $10 million of, of state debt, and we got to keep our, our state lands. And so that's why uh, some of my Western states' friends have problems, but we kept those lands and did the federal government didn't get them. But uh, we're in the middle of a revolution almost, I guess, in, in generation, and our subcommittee has held a number of hearings about looking at how other uh, markets do. And uh, one of the things I want to say is that Texas, a decade ago, produced 492 
1,000 megawatts of wind power. Uh, this last year, Texas produced 58 million megawatts of hours a year. And, uh, and so we're benefiting from the uh, wind power. In fact, there are certain days that wind power actually is producing more electricity than coal in Texas. Uh, of course, we're also benefit from the reasonable price natural gas that's in our backyard. Um, one of my concerns, and uh, we've heard the talk of resiliency, and, and I disagree with Secretary uh, Perry, even though I served in the legislature with him many years ago, and he, uh, Texas went the route we have when he was governor for so many years. Um, but uh, uh, many supporters of the proposed sub subsidies are said that we're on the brink of resiliency crisis. Uh, Chairman McIntyre, can you elaborate on the commission's views about the state of resiliency in the grid, and do we face an immediate crisis due to future closing of coal and nuclear plants? Grid resilience is now a matter of declared priority for the FERC, and we are proceeding in that fashion. We are assembling the record that I referenced earlier. We've heard already from our nation's operators of regional transmission organizations and independent system operators, their perspectives, and we are waiting further input from stakeholders on it. It's a critical issue, and there are different ways of looking at it. One is operational in terms of is there equipment or are there facilities that would be needed to help shore up the resilience of the grid. The other is economic, and in effect, a market. We need to ensure that our markets are properly compensating the resources that we regard as important to ensure the resilience of our grid. And so we are looking very hard at those issues now. We'll continue to examine the materials submitted to us in the record and in the hope of getting this right. And you're looking at alternatives, too, because I know the same problem. We, we get about 20 percent of our electricity in Texas from nuclear power. Uh, we couldn't expand it because the investment's not, oper uh, not, uh, not available now. And uh, so there are other ways. And, of course, from Texas, as my colleague from uh, uh, Fort Bend County would say, we'd be glad to put another pipeline up to the northeast to send them some more natural gas or export it around the coast for them. Um, my colleague uh, Pete Olson mentioned um, my next question is on the concern about United Airlines uh, Inc. versus FERC. And I apologize, I haven't read that case, but uh, I always view the Master Limited Partnerships, it's been so successful in capitalizing pipelines, particularly. Um, it's almost like a Chapter S corporation. You pass through that so it's not corporate double taxation. Um, and, but that would, if we cannot use that as an investment instrument, I don't know how we're going to continue the expansive growth that uh, I think FERC recognizes. We need more pipelines to get product uh, to the market where to, so we won't have a resiliency problem. Um, Mr. Chairman, I realize FERC's public policy is precipitated by the D.C. Circuit's court's opinion. I'd like to know if FERC has conducted its own analysis of whether or not double recovery uh, existed before the decision. Has FERC thought there was a problem at the policy prior to the United case? That's, <coughs> excuse me, Congressman. That's a matter that was, in effect, handed to us by the court, so we had no choice, really, as a regulatory agency, but to take it at face value and to act upon it. We had no independent analysis of the double recovery issue, as is customary under the statutes that govern our actions. We act in accordance with the arguments that are put forward to us by the litigants in most instances, and this was such a situation. I thought uh, the court directed the FERC to consider how it could demonstrate there was no double recovery. Is FERC looking at that particular issue um, to be able to answer whatever the circuit court said? Well, here, too, back to legal processes, I suspect that we will have no choice but to look closely at that issue in light of further procedural steps that the parties will have a right to invoke, such as requests for rehearing. Okay. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And I know um, the jurisdiction of that typically is in ways and means, but since it deals with FERC, uh, we have some jurisdiction in our own committee, so we might look at that to make sure we don't eliminate this ability for uh, uh, investment in the pipelines that the whole country needs. And I'll yield back my time. Thank you. Thank you. Gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Latta. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thanks to the commissioners for being with us today. Greatly appreciate it and hearing your views. Uh, Commissioner Powelson, if I could start uh, my questions with you. Uh, as you point out in your testimony, under the Energy Policy Act of 2005, FERC was given the authority to oversee the reliability of the bulk power system. This included the authority to approve mandatory cybersecurity reliability standards. And of course, during the first half of 2018, we have seen news stories about hackers working to undermine the safety and security of our nation's energy infrastructure, including cyber attacks launched by Russian agents against the power grid, energy, nuclear, and commercial facilities, and critical manufacturing sectors. Would you go into more detail about what FERC is doing to address these attacks, and how will you work with the North American Electric Reliability Corporation to reassess and, if necessary, revise the reliability standards? Thank you, Congressman, for your question. Um, first and foremost, these reliability standards, um, which apply to users, owners, and operators of the bulk power system, were developed, as you mentioned, by NERC. And I think we continue to collaborate with other federal agencies in those compliance uh, measures. Uh, you also have on top of that the critical infrastructure uh, protocols or SIP standards. And I mentioned earlier in my testimony uh, the collaborative effort with NERC and working with the ISACs and the collaborative effort around the utilities, uh, the gas industry, and other impacted entities uh, working in collaboration together. Some have reported back, uh, they think these, some of these reporting requirements are a little onerous. Um, I would refrain from saying that because, again, um, we can't really cut corners on cybersecurity. We've got to give you all peace of mind that we are protecting and, and applying the needed resources to protect the bulk power system. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, these threat vectors are changing radically, daily. Um, and it's important that we continue to work with the other agents. That's why I gave a, a nice shout out this morning to Secretary Perry and the leadership that DOE has shown on this issue with the launching of their new Office of Cybersecurity. Right. And uh, we appreciate when the Secretary is here when he gave his testimony. Let me just follow up because to address the threat of cyber attacks to our energy grid, I'm working with my colleague, uh, Representative McNerney, to in, in introducing two bipartisan pieces of legislation, these bills, H.R. 5239, the Cyber Sense Act, and H.R. 5240, the Enhancing Grid Security Through Public-Private Partnership Act, were the subject of a legislative hearing in the subcommittee uh, last month. Under H.R. 5239, the Secretary of Energy would be directed to establish a voluntary CyberSense program to test cybersecure products intended for use in the bulk power system. The Secretary would then maintain a database on these products and the technologies and provide technical advice to energy stakeholders to develop solutions to mitigate identify, identified cybersecurity vulnerabilities. You mentioned in your testimony that FERC Again, who has worked closely with DOE to maintain an awareness of emerging cyber threats. Do you think uh, this policy would help improve the safety and security of our energy infrastructure and it help address these threats? Congressman, I think it, it is a, a wonderful effort um, that we, any type of legislative construct that recognizes, one, collaboration in the cyberspace, two, ad adequate capacity building, even in even at the state level. So I, I can just, at first glance, tell you I'd, I'd be very supportive of a bipartisan bill to give those resources uh, to DOE, working with the FERC, as Chairman McIntyre mentioned. We do have a strong collaborative effort in place uh, with uh, TSA, uh, PHMSA, uh, DOT, uh, Homeland Security, and I think this, this is another example of how we can build on those capacities. Thank you. Uh, Chairman McIntyre, I've long believed in an all above energy policy. Our nation has vast energy resources that need to be utilized, and we should be doing everything we can to make sure that our energy industries grow. By doing this, we can make sure that we are truly energy independent. Mr. Chairman, do you believe that is a, a vital importance to our national security that we continue to maintain a diverse portfolio of energy sources for electricity generation? Very much so, Congressman. I, too, express my view in the same terms. All of the above is the appropriate approach to how we should satisfy our electricity needs as a nation. All different types of electric gener generating resources and other resources, indeed. Storage, 
distributed energy resources and the like. Where this will be tested is in the very tricky area that a number of us have addressed here today, the interplay between state resource choices and our federal role of ensuring that our markets operate properly. If we really do mean that we are committed to an all of the above resource policy, can we be content to see a category of resources go away and exit the scene? Very, very tricky public policy question that we're grappling with as we proceed with our grid resilience work. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. My time's expired, and you back. Mr. Doyle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, and thank you all for appearing before us today. Uh, many of us are running between two hearings simultaneously, so I apologize that I wasn't here to hear your testimony. Uh, Commissioner Paulson, as a fellow Pennsylvanian, I'm going to pick on you first. Um, at your confirmation hearing last year, you said, what I learned from my experience uh, in NARUC is that what works in Pennsylvania might not work in other jurisdictions, and you highlighted the proud appreciation that we all have for our individual states' rights in supporting our state energy policies. Um, however, I also read that you may have some reservations uh, explaining that state interventions come with consequences to reliability. And I can't argue with Secretary Perry's point that these markets aren't pure, but the policies all sound good, and I respect that, but the reality is the policies aren't synchronizing with the system, and therein lies a significant challenge. Your testimony highlights an inherent tension, uh, the oversight role of FERC, uh, but the independence of the states. And I know my good friend, uh, Representative Shimkus, asked for some additional clarification here, uh, but I, I wasn't present for that. So I understand you said you felt the commission should respect states' rights within reason. Um, do you think FERC oversight or potential intervention will or should be applied on a case-by-case -case basis? Uh, do you think that Congress ought to provide additional clarity here also? Congressman Doyle, I, I will start with, I think the, the FERC is well equipped if you look at uh, some, some cases that we've had over the last decade. Talent Energy versus Hughes in Maryland, Talent Energy versus Solomon in New Jersey. Um, recent constructs of, of addressing in the post-polar vortex, we had an issue in PJM with a 24% forced outage rate. We dealt with capacity performance. So I, I think the markets and the work that the FERC does, we have the tools to address these issues. When you say case-by-case -case basis, if I look over those cases uh, where we had to send a loud and clear message to the state of New Jersey and the state of Maryland, on capacity resources being subsidized in the market, and the con by the way, the impact it would have had with generation in Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. we the FERC very in, for, in terms of a rule of law uh, did its job, and the court recognized that. I have said it earlier. I'm very proud of my Pennsylvania experience. Pennsylvania has a very successful renewable portfolio standard led under Governor Rendell and former DEP Secretary Katie McGinty. But let me give you, as a former state senator, what happened. In that construct, we looked at picking, the state picked really 13 categories of what qualifies for a renewable portfolio standard. Well, guess what? Back then, I remember, there were pushes to get nuclear as part of that RPS. It was outright rejected. So here we are today, as we're having conversations, that state construct in Pennsylvania, as an example, did not recognize the value of nuclear power. Um, and if the state wants to go down that path, um, we're seeing it more recently this past week in New Jersey. Um, they're more than willing to do so. My drawing the line in the sand is how it impacts the wholesale power markets. And once we surrender that flag, it's, you know, it, it's, we, we're out of business. We've got to protect the sanctity of those organized markets. Mm -hmm. So I recognize that as a Pennsylvanian, but I also recognize in my new role that oversight of those highly functioning, well-organized markets. Yeah, and many Pennsylvanians, including myself, uh, are strong supporters of nuclear fire. It, it both satisfies reliability issues and it's also carbon free. Uh, and, and I think uh, there should be alarm bells going off across the country as, as we see how many of these plants uh, may not go through relicensing, and uh, they're going to be replaced mostly for baseload capacity with whether it's natural gas or, or something else that, that emits greenhouse gases, and it makes it almost impossible for us to, to meet our climate change goals. 
Um, Commissioner LeFleur, I want to quote from your statement regarding the NOPR because I think it's exceptional in describing the current situation we face. The Commission, and this is, this is your quote, the Commission should continue to focus on its efforts not on slowing transition from the past, but on easing the transition to the future. We must continue to guide grid operators in sustaining reliability and resilience within a system that is likely to be more cleaner, more dynamic, and in some instances more distributed and deployed by an efficient market for the benefit of customers. I'm amazed by the technological developments we've witnessed in the energy sector. The pace has gone from a, a walk to a jog to a sprint. And looking into the next decade or two decades from now, how do you think the regulatory bodies or agencies need to change to better reflect and adapt to these changes? And what can we do here at our committee to facilitate those changes? Well, thank you for the question and for the compliment. Um, I think one of the points of stress in the future is going to be the line between federal and state, not because of any overweening ambition on the part of this commission or the federal government, but because we're seeing more distributed resources, even behind the customer meter, um, collectively behaving just like a central station resource, and sometimes even more resilient because of the ability to modularize them if there's any kind of a weather event or an attack. So I think that... Um, we, as has been mentioned, we had a two-day tech conference last week, but I think figuring out how we best deploy those resources for the future is where, where the line, where the public policy people, like everyone in this room, have to be working now because the technology is coming so quickly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Harper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to each of you for being here and for the dedicated job that you're doing on an important issue. Uh, maybe as a follow-up to Mr. Doyle's question, Mr. Chairman, if I could uh, ask you, uh, traditionally the regulation of, of uh, DERs has been the jurisdiction of states and localities. However, with the issuance of Order Number 841 and its proposal for the aggregation of DERs for the purpose of participating in wholesale electricity markets, uh, FERC could expand its authority at the expense of states and localities. So my question would be was how will you deal with any jurisdictional challenges that may come about? Thank you for the question, Congressman. There are a couple of different things going on here. One is uh, electricity storage resources and then separately from that distributed energy generating resources. As to each category, honestly I'm not particularly troubled by any sort of jurisdictional creep because that power would make its way onto our grid in, a, grid in a way that we could regulate it only after it had been aggregated and put forth to a market that we regulated, a wholesale electricity market. And there certainly is no attempt on the part of this commission to in any way thwart the ability of a state, for example, to determine in a retail level transaction what the owner of the generating resource would be what level that owner would be compensated. Right. And so, honestly, I don't see that as being a, a particularly grave concern. Well, thank you for, for that answer. And Mr. Chairman, uh, if I may ask you, you know, certainly, as you know, we talk about energy infrastructure. Uh, it's a very capital intensive uh, venture and, and Wall Street investors require a very high degree of regulatory certainty and, and sound uh, rate making uh, policies before committing capital. Does FERC currently have a methodology in place to set transmission ROEs? Yes, we do, sir. Long, long standing. Okay. Long standing. And how many complaints are currently pending regarding transmission ROEs? We have a number of them pending. A ballpark. Are, you I say a number? A dozen or so. Okay. So what is the timetable for resolving uh, those complaints that you just mentioned? Those matters are actively being worked upon within our agency right now. They, they are not subject to a specific timetable. There's something that, is our, okay. that we are paying attention to. Our most important job, obviously, is to get it right. Obviously, and we want you to do that. That's good. Uh, under EPAC uh, 2005, FERC developed a policy, and that's in Order uh, 679, I believe, which provides for incentive rate treatment to encourage the development of transmission line infrastructure. 
While this policy has been in effect since 2006, can you elaborate on the status of this incentive policy now? It's something that Commissioner Glick mentioned as, okay. in his view, it's something that probably is ripe for some fresh attention. In a general sense, I would agree with that. Uh, Commissioner Glick, you care to comment? Sure. Uh, thanks, Mr. Harper. Um, I, uh, I the, when, as you were exactly right, so in 2005, Congress did provide uh, FERC the authority to provide incentive rate making, and the Commission did have an incentive rate making policy, and there was a belief that the Commission was going too far providing incentives for too many activities. So the Commission uh, subsequently issued a new policy statement that's somewhat retrenched from that particular policy, and, and I think that the criticism may be that the Commission may have gone too far in the other direction. I think that we need to take a, a fresh look at the policies. Are, are, are we incenting the right things? For instance, we incent RTO participation, but a lot of people already, utilities are participating in RTOs regardless of whether they have an incentive or not. But we really should be incenting, are we using transmission capacity more efficiently? Are we using new technologies to make transmission capacity uh, more efficient? Those are the type of things that I think Congress gave us the authority to do, and I think it's a good idea to take a look at. Are, are we uh, still seeing our transmission developers uh, still filing applications for incentive rates? That's still happening. Absolutely. Okay. I do often. And are you are you believe it's at the appropriate rate and amount? Well, I think there are. We have to take that on a case by case basis. Sure. I actually descended from one of those particular cases, but for the most part, I, th I think that I think the commission has approved those those incentive rates. Thank you, Commissioner Glick. And with that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Chair, I would recognize the lady from Florida, Ms. Castor. Thank you, Chairman Upton, and welcome to our uh, FERC commissioners. Thank you for being here today. In the hearing last week uh, on the Department of Energy budget with Secretary Perry, I asked him about research and development investments in energy storage uh, because energy storage is so crucial to uh, increasing America's renewable energy sources, incorporating them, and modernizing the electric grid. Uh, and even though the budget doesn't really match uh, what we'd like to do, I think the Congress will come back and say, we're committed to doing this just like we did in the omnibus bill. Uh, and in fact, I noticed the Department of Energy just this morning issued a big press release on solar technologies and, and investments. So, uh, But I have to say I was heartened by FERC's uh, recently issued order, a five to zero uh, vote to remove market barriers for energy storage to participate in wholesale markets in the bulk power grid. Uh, because allowing energy storage to compete with fossil fuels like gas and coal uh, will enhance competition. It'll help us develop more clean energy resources and hopefully keep electric rates affordable for the average American. Uh, and experts say that the number one issue in clean innovative technologies is being able to integrate uh, renewable energy with the large bulk transmission grid. So I commend you uh, on your recent efforts to accommodate the growing clean renewable energy sources. Uh, however, the Commission declined to also eliminate barriers for distributed energy resources, something that we were just talking about, which would help uh, further integrate renewable sources into the electric grid. I, I saw in one press report it said that, that the Commission was disappointed uh, that you could not issue an order similar to your storage decision for distributed energy resources. So, Mr. Glick, why, why did the Commission uh, not remove market barriers for distributed energy sources like it did for energy storage, and uh, what's the next step? Thank you for your question, Ms. Castor, and I, and I agree with you. I think that new technologies, storage, and, and distributed energy resources are the way of the future and are going to provide significant amount of benefits. I think the Commission had a number of, there were still some questions that were left during the rulemaking process about reliability and how we interact with the states in terms of who, uh, uh, the distributed resource aggregation. Uh, so we actually had a technical conference last week. We had a, a, a two-day conference, seven panels. I think we got enough information, in my opinion, to address the issue. I, the Commission has a statutory responsibility to make sure that we don't, that there's no undue discrimination against any particular technologies, and I think this is a good example where I think we're, we're required to address this matter. So what are the next steps? You've had the, the technical conference, uh, Mr. McIntyre. What, what's uh, next on your agenda on this? We did indeed have the technical conference. It was a two-day technical conference, a lot of very, very good in input from stake stakeholders of various roles within the industry. And I anticipate, I agree with Commissioner Glick, that the record that we are assembling through that process will enable us to take steps comparable, I would suggest, to the steps that you noted with regard to storage. That's I'm not intending to forecast a particular outcome, I'm just saying 
that we've got enough now to go on to make a determination about what the appropriate steps forward are. So stakeholders still have the ability to weigh in with FERC? Yes, ma'am. Okay. M Ms. LaFleur, where do you think this is going? What advice would you give to stakeholders and, and folks in the public who are interested in weighing in? Well, the advice I always give is to be as specific as possible to help us, and that's true even more so in this docket because of the real complexity of what we were looking at. There are really two macro issues. The first is the money issues. You know, if you have these deployed distributed storage resources that can be paid at the state level, they can be used by the customer, or they can be paid at the wholesale level. Who pays what to whom? How do we figure out we don't have double counting and so forth? I think that'll require some very specific rules but um, the more suggestions we get, the better. The second is the operating issues of how the different control centers talk to each other. We've got some great testimony on that. I think one of the big issues we're gonna have to think about as a body now is how uniform we make the rules as we put them out versus allowing regional variation. We heard a lot from um, the people, some of the people who testified about wanting different regions to go in different directions here. Um, I'm somewhat of the belief that the technology is marching so quickly that we should try to figure out what best practices are now, but that's what we'll be debating, and I think we'd like input on that. Well, thank you very much. I think it is an exciting time for the development of uh, clean energy technology, and I commend you on your interest in pushing this forward. Thank you very much. Mr. McKinley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I over the past eight years <clears throat> on this committee, we've heard a lot of comments and hearings about the, um, uh, our aging uh, coal and nuclear fleet, uh, that it's out there. And unfortunately, in many regards, it's, it's very expensive to upgrade those facilities. Um, and in so doing, when they do make those upgrades, sometimes it, they, they lose their competitive, uh, competitiveness and it puts them in a dilemma. Uh, now, what we're talking about now is, it, again, is we have across this country, we have 531 coal-fired power plants have shuttered in the last 10 years. We've had 11 nuclear power plants have closed down during that period of time. Now we keep having hearings, keep discussing it, but I wanna move from the abstract to something concrete. I've got a power plant in Pleasance County, West Virginia. It's a 1.3, uh, 1300 megawatt, 1.3 gigawatts of power. They tried to sell that plant to back in, to go for, because it's a merchant plant. They tried to move it over to the regula regulated, and they were denied. So as a result, the, the operator now is seriously considering, and I believe it'll happen before the end of the year, of declaring bankruptcy and shutting that plant down. Now just follow the, the ramifications of that. This is a small county. 30% of the tax revenue comes from that power plant. 30%, so 30%, that's, that's an overnight reduction that's gonna affect their school system. What about their EMS? What about their hospital? All the things that the county provides services and now a 30% reduction as a result of this. Now, it goes further. We can further this domino effect. If this power plant closes down, it's very high likelihood the, produ the coal producer that supplies that power plant will similarly declare bankruptcy. If he declares bankruptcy, his relief will be to get away from his pension, his UMWA pension responsibility, which currently now funds 120,000 retirees. Now the object would be as if, if that's reduced, they would fall, they would be shifted over likely to the Federal Pension Guarantee Fund. But I've got a letter from the Pension Guarantee Fund it says, don't put those 120,000 on us because then we'll go under. So you see the domino effect of this. A mere request somehow provides some assistance so they could be an existing power plant. And it's been, there's, it's been rebuffed. So I, I'm, I'm just curious about, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't, just wouldn't it be more efficient and prudent to try to find a, a vehicle, a means, whether it's, uh, the 403, whether it's a 202C, some modification of that, so we can keep some of our marginal power plants operative. Now, so, Mr. Chairman, if I can ask you on it, when FERC denied the 403, 
was there a, did anyone come up with what the cost to the consumer could have been if we had, if, it, if 403 had been imposed on, let's say, Pleasance County power plant? Do any, does anyone have an idea what the cost could be just to keep it operating? I guess the answer is none of you know. I'm sorry, Congressman. Uh, you refer to the cost of the Secretary of Energy's 403 NOPR directed to us? Just what would it cost to keep that power plant operating? Are you talking about $50 a year per customer? I, don't, I do not have that figure. Could you get that to me? Because this, uh, we have reason to believe it's less than $50 a year per customer. And they, we, the consumer currently is paying $50 a year for tree trimming. We will have the hundreds of jobs you. that could be lost, the pensions that could be lost for our miners and our steel workers, all that would be affected with this. I think we have a more responsibility to look at this thing holistically rather than just an ideological fight against what we think is a free market. And I think too many of you have said, both publicly and privately, that we really are questionable whether we have a free market system in energy. Would you agree? Let me just ask you, Mr. Do we have a free market system in energy? We do not have a perfect market system in energy. That is certain. Okay, because I think, Mr. Powson, you said in, in Pennsylvania that without the subsidy for wind and solar, there wouldn't have been any buildup there. Is that correct? I put it in the context of the, the, the renewable portfolio standard, how it was designed. Okay. Um, we also, so, though, in our RPS, I believe we have a requirement uh, set aside for waste coal in that RPS. So, but yes, your point to the chairman's point and to, chair, and to Secretary Perry's point, these, these, these are not pure markets. There's been Thank you. I don't think they are either. So I'll just close with again. I'm asking, look seriously at the bigger picture, what we're going to do to communities like Pleasant County, West Virginia. A 30% overnight loss of tax revenue. How are they supposed to meet their education demands, their health care? Please. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Congressman. Mr. Tonko. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Chair McIntyre and all of our commissioners for appearing here this morning. Last month, I held a roundtable with a variety of stakeholders interested in storage, and everyone agreed that Order 841 was a necessary step forward to uh, lower barriers for storage's participation in the markets. Chairman McIntyre or Commissioner Glick, do you believe reducing barriers and enabling greater storage deployment will be beneficial to grid reliability and resilience? I'll jump in first. I think every avenue for reliable energy that can make its way to our grid can only help resilience and reliability. Hence my expression earlier of my support for an all of the above approach to satisfying our nation's energy needs. Thank you. And I, Commissioner Glenn? Thank you, Mr. Tonko. I, I agree. I, I, the, uh, there are numerous benefits with accessing distributed resources and, and aggregating di distributed resources. I would point out the two be one, increased competition in the market while certainly lower, lower wholesale electric prices. But secondly, it, I think it gives RTO and ISO operators more um, uh, input, more, more understanding of what's going on behind the meter, which is certainly, I think, an increasing uh, concern with regard to the reliability of the grid. So I think it would, uh, adding aggregation to the mix would actually increase enhanced reliability and resilience. Thank you. That's good to hear because I believe it has a number of significant benefits, a reduction of peak demands, uh, integration of variable renewable energy, frequency regulation and congestion relief, uh, so it's encouraging. Uh, as this order moves forward, I hope you will continue to seek to reduce barriers for emerging technologies and work to resolve issues from the Distributed Energy Resources Technical Conference. But I also want to address another recent issue that was considered by the Commission. The relationship between FERC, electricity markets, and state policies is not a simple one. Uh, but certainly states have a significant role in determining their generation mix. I want to ask about ISO New England's competitive auctions with sponsored policy resources proposal. Um, and paragraph 22 of the Commission's order states, we intend to use the minimum offer price rule to address the impacts of state policies on the wholesale capacity markets. And minimum offer uh, price rule will be the, quote, standard solution to manage the impact of state policies. Um, I know that there's been some discussion uh, about state opportunity, states' rights. Commissioner Glick, uh, I'd like to hear from you. I know you dissented uh, due to this section. Can you explain your concerns about the use of uh, 
of MOPR to interfere with state policies? Thank you, Mr. Tanko. Uh, yes, I did dissent, and dissented in large part to that paragraph 22 that you referenced. Uh, in, in large part, uh, I, I don't believe the Federal Power Act gives FERC the ability to choose to make resource decision making, resource decisions. So I think it's up to the states to do that. In addition to that, I have some great, grave concerns that it's actually going to dramatically increase the cost of electricity in these regional markets as well, because states may still choose to pursue these policies, but if, they're, if, if those resources are then replaced with another generation resources, it's just going to lead to overbuilding, and, and, and consumers are going to pay more. And thank you for that. And do you believe there is a role for governmental programs to address legitimate policy considerations that arise as a consequence of power generation, such as uh, clean air? or cl uh, climate change, if I dare mention that? Absolutely. These electric markets, for the most part, don't take into account externalities. So I think states and the federal government both have a role in ensuring externalities such as greenhouse gas emissions need to be addressed in, in, in another manner. And I believe you're indicating this, but just for clarity, if MOPR is a standard solution, could it result in consumers paying more to prop up generators that run counter to the policies adopted by those states? Absolutely, that's one of my significant concerns, yes. In my home state of New York, we recently implemented a clean energy standard to make significant reductions in greenhouse gas pollution, which is not currently priced into the market. Should New York have the right to determine its energy future and protect its citizens from environmental impacts? I think certainly New York should have the right, and I think one of the concerns, if you are sure supportive of these capacity markets, is that if state policies are then overturned by FERC decision-making, those states are going to cause their utilities to pull out of these capacity markets. Mm -hmm. And I know you all supported the storage order, but similarly, we're seeing states enact or consider mandates and incentives for storage resources. Like you all, states have recognized the benefits of these technologies, including reliability benefits, and want to see them as part of their resource mix. If storage resources are able to participate in capacity markets, might some of these state policies come into conflict with the MOPR solution? I think, I think there's a very real danger of that under paragraph 22. I could just add to that, Congressman, um, uh, in regards to specifically paragraph 22. I voted for uh, the underlying CASPER order because I thought it was important and a necessary step, and ISO New England uh, had put a great amount of time and effort into it. Um, having worked in, in, in this chamber before, you don't always agree with every single word of legislative text on a bill that you vote for. And I think going forward, I thought it was more important that CASPER passed than to, to focus on uh, you know, every word of paragraph two was in there, and I, I agree with the valid concerns that you're raising. So when you, with that being said, is there a need for addressing this as we go forward? I think that, uh, as the chairman uh, quite eloquently spoke to uh, earlier, that juxtaposition, that collision between market forces and our wanting to, to uphold these markets with state policy rights and, and, and uh, state interventions, um, that is going to be something that we continue to juggle with. And uh, I, for one, believe that you know some accommodation um, is necessary. Well, I'm proud of the efforts my state is making, and as a downwind state, uh, we don't want to be impacted by poor policy. So with that, I appreciate all of your comments, and uh, I yield back, Mr. Chair. How much time has expired? Gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Kinzinger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for uh, being here and spending some time with us today. We appreciate it. And uh, I, I just want to uh, thank you also for your commitment to making sure that our uh, homes and businesses have reliable energy. I think we all recognize how vital your mission is to our nation's economic uh, and national security. That being said, I remain concerned about the resiliency and reliability of our energy supply. For years now, we've recognized the precarious situation that our nuclear plants are in. My district is home to four nuclear power plants, and uh, which is the most in the country, and, uh, and it accounts for 12% of the nation's nuclear power. These plants provide good jobs, they're good for our environment, and I think we've seen that they're proven performers during extreme weather events, whether it's polar vortex, hurricanes, things like that. Yet two plants in Illinois are still almost closed. Thousands of jobs and a significant amount of clean energy were almost lost. The state of Illinois had to step in to recognize the important role that these plants play in our state economy, but also in the reliability of our energy supply. Unfortunately, now other plants and other states are facing the same fate. So to the whole panel, uh, as you know, in some wholesale energy markets, certain resources like nuclear are struggling to recover costs and remain competitive. Um, which has led to the early retirement of plants that could otherwise continue to run for decades. Do you think energy markets can better value resource attributes for all types of energy generators? And what about resiliency and reliability specifically? Congressman, I'll jump in first here. Thank you for the question. Sure. 
We have acknowledged here the importance of ensuring that states are able to exercise their legitimate role in making resource decisions and expressing resource preferences through law, law such as you have acknowledged that Illinois has done with regard to nucle the nuclear fleet there. And we just have to ensure that with regard to the wholesale markets that we oversee, that rates are indeed just and reasonable, which is our longstanding statutory standard, and that nothing done at the state level amounts to a pressing of a thumb on the scale, or as my colleague Commissioner Powelson has said, picking winners and lo losers in a way that we would regard as inconsistent with the statutory role. I but let me ask you, like, kind of more deeply on that, if, if you look at, is there a value to the reliability issue? Or are we just, I mean, is there a value to resiliency, reliability? Um, things it's nuclear? Yes. Certainly my view is we, we very much need to be an all of the above. We need an all of the above policy in terms of satisfying our nation's generating needs. And I, I certainly personally include nuclear in that makes well, I mean, that's that's great. I appreciate that. Um, but the question is, do you think that you can better value resource attributes like that to nuclear, for instance? That's a question that's before us now in our ongoing proceeding on grid resilience. Are there resilience attributes that are present but are not being adequately compensated? If the answer Good. to that question is yes, then I think we've got to decide what steps are appropriate. Okay. Anybody else want to add to that? I will pick up on it. I, I heard earlier from, from Chairman Walden, we talked about customers and customers having choice in these competitive markets. In your state, your former governor and your legislature adopted electric restructuring. Those nuclear plants you referenced, customers paid a competitive transition charge as part of a stranded cost investment. And so here we are today in my state and your state where we have, we're the second largest nuclear production state, where something that was, quote, too cheap to meter is coming back into the market, whether it's a value around resiliency. And we're being asked, theoretically, your constituents are being asked to do another stranded cost for those assets. So if I'm a gas operator or I'm an emerging technology in the market, I'm not getting any type of backstop for my resource. And I could be clean and efficient and resilient. So I think to the chairman's credit, we're looking at that in, a, in, in developing this record. Uh, there are characteristics of nuclear plants that will clear in these markets. It's a concern that, uh, that I've seen in my state where a standalone nuclear reactor like Three Mile Island is under tremendous stress. And why is that? Well, it's because 100 miles north up the 83 corridor is gas coming out of the ground at $1.21 per MMBTU and a power plant that has a much lower cost to run and can provide baseload resource on the grid. And I, but I think the question is long-term, how do we value the fact that that may change? It may go from a dollar twenty right. to a billion dollars, right? In which case, now we find ourselves, as some European markets and other markets have, that undervalued nuclear power in a tail chase against the cost of electricity now. Specifically, I just got back from Australia, and they're like finding themselves in that kind of a situation as well. So uh, my time has run out. Uh, I thank you all for being here, and Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Chair, would recognize Mr. Griffith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, appreciate it very much. Uh, a lot of good information floating around here. I wanna go talk about pipelines. Um, we've talked about how we need pipelines to get the natural gas where it needs to go, particularly in the Northeast. But in the Commonwealth of Virginia, we have two pipelines coming through right now, pretty much at the same uh, general uh, area. And people have a lot of questions, and I have a lot of questions. And FERC can do a better job. And I talk uh, to you all about this because a lot of you all are new and we got to figure it out. And so I appreciate, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, you uh, revisiting the 1999 standing policy on, pipe, uh, policy on pipeline applications. Um, but uh, let me just tell you about the one coming through my district. One comes through my district and one doesn't, but they're fairly close together. I learned about it when a member of a board of supervisors in the county called me up and said there are surveyors all over the county. Nobody knows what they're doing, but they claim it has something to do with a gas pipeline. Now, that's not y'all's fault. I get it. That's somebody else's fault, the folks who were, you know, not informing the elected officials. But I didn't know anything about it. The county didn't know anything about it. Nobody knew anything. Then comes FERC adding insult to injury 
had two public hearings. Goodlatte, Hurt, who was here then, and myself begged for more public hearings so that people could travel uh, a shorter distance to get to these hearings because it was affecting their communities. Didn't happen. Crickets. And so I'm glad you're looking at it, and, I, and I'm going to assume uh, Mr. McIntyre, or Chairman McIntyre that this new plan uh, that you're looking at will review the public comment meeting process as part of your evaluation. Is my assumption correct, yes or no? Yes, it is correct. That's very much within the scope of what we intend to review. And can I further assume that you are committed to, to working to ensure there's a method by which uh, FERC offers full and transparent comment from the public about potential projects. Can I make that assumption as well, yes or no? Yes. Now, I have a bill in. It was, it was, it's been so frustrating that Senator Tim Kaine and, and I, we don't generally agree on a lot of things. We both have bills in. Now, we got different versions because we don't always agree on things, but we have bills in on this. Mine is H.R. 2893, the Pipeline Fairness and Transparency Act, and this is to express these concerns that our constituents have been living with now for several years and still feel very frustrated. But I'd like to even look at going further than that. So I want your, you all's input on that, but I would also like input on things that we can do, like on placing the lines, on putting the lines in the same corridor, while the folks in that corridor may not appreciate it. You don't have two different sets of communities all across the Commonwealth of Virginia being disrupted. And then maybe, taking a look at where are, where are the companies and what are the policies where the companies are placing not only the pipeline but the, the, uh, the pumping facilities to, to move the pipe down the line, uh, and do they need to be quite as big? A lot of folks are concerned about that. So as we go forward, are you all willing to work, and I would ask each of you, are you willing to work with us to try to get uh, some legislation that makes folks feel like it's not just being crammed down their throats but they actually have input and that somebody out there is actually listening. We would wel welcome the opportunity to work with you on that. I don't want to leave you with the false impression that we don't have mechanisms in place today for proper public input because we certainly do. And one of the key issues that's before us even in our, uh, under our existing policy is to make a determination as to whether a particular project is needed and as okay. to root, I'm sorry to interrupt, sir. Well, and, and I'd be happy to get more answer, but my time is running out and I've got another subject to hit, but I would just tell you the frustration level in Virginia is so high that while you all have a system, I appreciate you looking at it because it apparently isn't working to give confidence in the public, and I, I appreciate that. Now I've got to move on to uh, some issues related to uh, uh, businesses and, and homes that are on, on non-federal hydropower project facilities. I have gotten a lot of questions uh, from friends of uh, Claytor Lake that I will submit for the record and, and hope that you all will answer after the fact because uh, we have some real issues related to shoreline management plans. This issue didn't really develop until in the last 10 or 15 years, and so we have some questions about how that uh, goes forward. I picked up uh, Robert Hurt's bill on shoreline management, the Shore Act, which is um, uh, H.R. 1538, uh, and I hope that you all give us some input on that, but I think this is something that we need to work on together because a lot of folks feel their property rights have been affected, and of course economic development has been affected as well. So look forward to working with you all on those issues as well, and I see that my time is up, and Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Chairman yields back. Dr. Bouchon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Chairman McIntyre, in your testimony, you state that one of your top priorities is to protect and promote the resilience of the bulk power system. I'm pleased to hear that we share this same priority, but I remain concerned with the lack of urgency to address properly valuing reliable and fuel security energy sources. There are many sources of energy that can power the grid, and I'm a supporter of an all of the above energy strategy. However, after every major winter storm, whether it be the 2014 polar vortex, or the most recent bomb cyclone studies conclude that coal-fired electricity was needed to prevent major blackouts, establishing coal-fired electricity is one of the most reliable, fuel-secure, and affordable energy sources available. Just so you know, every coal mine in the state of Indiana is in my district in many of the coal-fired power plants. Even with its reliability, coal-fired power plants continue to retire 
in alarming numbers for many of the reasons we've already discussed. 39 coal power generating units have been forced to close in my home state of Indiana alone. I'm supportive of the efforts you're taking to properly value traditional baseload generation and provide our nation with a more reliable and secure grid, but I'm concerned that if we don't act soon, more coal plants will continue to retire prematurely, leaving my constituents in my state without reliable energy and many, many of the risks uh, at risk of losing their jobs, as was outlined by the uh, 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 Congressman McKinley about how that, uh, that goes down the line. This is why I've introduced H.R. 5270, the Electricity Reliability and Fuel Security Act, which would create a temporary tax credit covering only a small portion of the cost to operate and maintain existing coal-fired power plants. And in fact, just yesterday, Senator Capito from West Virginia introduced a companion bill uh, to H.R. 5270 in the Senate, uh, showcasing the urgency of this matter. I believe the temporary tax credit, which would last for five years, is necessary to maintain the reliability and resilience of the grid while policymakers work together to agree on a long-term plan for the grid. We need a little bit more level playing field. Chairman McIntyre, can you provide an update on FERC's efforts on this issue, and are you su supportive of congressional action to maintain a reliable grid while the Commission collects comments on how to best address grid reliability? Yes, sir. It's very, the, the question you raised about coal is very much wrapped up within our grid resilience work, particularly given the way that the grid resili resilience topic was teed up for us in the first instance by Secretary Perry in his Section 403 action, the NOPER that was presented to us for our consideration. And so we have to look at this and ask ourselves the question whether those coal-fired generating resources are contributing grid resilience attributes in a way that cries out to be compensated at levels higher than they currently are receiving in the, in the marketplace. If the answer to that question is yes, then I think we have to address the very difficult question of what, are, what is it appropriate for us to do about that? The question is completely leg legitimate, and as you suggest in your statement, Congressman, this is broader than just grid resilience. I mean, there are economic issues here in play as well, so we understand how important the issue is. Yeah, I mean, when we're buying, when we're importing LNG for energy sources and we're using a lot of energy from our, our friends in Canada, you know, to l turn a blind eye to our own ways to generate energy, at least in the short run, is, is not the right thing. Mr. Chatterjee. Uh, Congressman, I just want to echo uh, that I share your sense of urgency. Um, I am uh, optimistic about the resilience proceeding um, and the docket that we have ongoing, but I'm concerned that it'll take time. And that's why during the course of our consideration of Secretary Perry's NOPER, I'd advocated for an interim solution. Um, what I've come to, to learn in the, in the subsequent months since we uh, uh, dealt with that NOPER is there are real challenges um, and and and. You cited the situation in New England, um, uh, the ISO New England fuel security study, you know, highlights that. And I do think uh, uh, the, the, the moment will come sooner rather than later when we are going to have to, to confront this. And your sense of urgency is right on and uh, look forward to seeing uh, how the legislative effort you have progresses. Thanks. And also just because um, all of the above, earlier this Congress, the House unanimously passed my bill 2872, the promoting Hydropower Development at Existing Non-Dams Act. You probably are, may or may not be aware of that. But would it, it would promote hydropower development at existing non-powered dams by establishing an expedited licensing process for qualifying facilities that was result in a decision on an application in two years or less. Senator Portman and Senator McCaskill have just recently introduced a companion bill in the Senate. And I think we have a good chance of getting that across the finish line uh, so that we can convert some non uh, hydropower generating dams across this country and ones that produce uh, long-standing clean energy. Thank you. I yield back. Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and thank the Commission for being here with us today. I, I've been closely following the discussion surrounding DOE's NOPER that, that the Commission rejected. As some of you probably know, my district in eastern and southeastern Ohio is home to an abundance of natural energy production, particularly natural gas and coal. Uh, so these issues hit especially close to home, and I take notice when major employers in my district speak out on this issue. For uh, instance, the CEO of Murray Energy recently stated that 
FERC did not do its job when it rejected this proposal. That, that is the DOE NOPER. Uh, Commissioner Powelson, I, I believe you recently made some comments indicating that you disagree uh, with Mr. Murray. Can you expound on that? Yeah, I, um, I take offense to the word feckless being used to colleagues that I serve with here. And as I mentioned earlier, that, that term was what again? Feckless uh, used to, to describe the, the FERC, uh, my colleagues, and the 1,320 employees that show up to work every day to do their job around safety and economic regulation and making sure our wholesale power markets are functioning. So um, I, I think I, your, uh, your testimony, I mean, your, your statement on social media, though, was more about conducting a debate, right? Uh, I refrained from, uh, from going down that path. I thought it was inappropriate, and I dialed it back rather quickly. Uh, Commissioner Chatterjee, I've read your testimony and wondered if you had any further thoughts on this issue. Uh, yes, sir. Obviously, um, uh, throughout our consideration of the DOE NOPER, uh, I expressed great sympathy with uh, uh, what Secretary Perry had proposed. And, uh, and I saw firsthand during uh, my time uh, serving Leader McConnell and, and working uh, in the Kentucky delegation, working with folks like yourself through various energy caucuses in the Congress, the impact, the, the, the severe impact that was uh, taking place in coal uh, communities throughout Appalachia, throughout Kentucky, throughout Ohio. Uh, the challenge we had is, uh, you know, serving at the commission as an independent regulator, we have to work based on the record that was before us. And unfortunately, uh, the record did not support compensating uh, fuel sources based on having that on-site fuel capability. That doesn't mean that the question that was posed by Secretary Perry wasn't the right question, and that doesn't mean that in our further work we won't be able to address these sensitive issues. But speaking to the, the manner in which the NOPA was handled, um, I'm a conservative. I believe in a narrow interpretation of statute, and my narrow reading of the record in this case was it simply didn't support it. And while I have deep sympathy for, uh, for, for the sentiments that Mr. Murray folks in your community are expressing and the concerns they have about the economic impact, the job impact, the cultural impact of these shutdowns. Um, from the seat I sit in now, our record simply didn't support taking action at that time. Well, thank you for clarifying. Um, uh, moving on to another subject, we've, we've also discussed uh, cyber attacks and data policy violations have been issues recently and frequently highlighted in the news. Uh, attacks on U.S. government agencies and universities, including FERC, for example. Uh, the recent uh, Energy Services Group attack. And the platform policy violation by a Facebook app developer. In light of these events, what are the Commission's thoughts on its current security prior or practices for protecting sensitive information such as CEII, Critical Electric Energy Infrastructure Information that FERC collects and regulated, uh, from regulated energy companies and shares with third parties. Is there any discussion on evaluating uh, methods to strengthen those practices? And let me, let me go back to you, Commissioner Powelson, in light of your focus on cybersecurity in your testimony, do you have any insight on this issue? Well, I think the work that we're be that's being done right now, working with NERC and refining some of these standards, one, there's kind of four points we're looking at. One is uh, the vendor remote access to data, also software uh, authenticity and information system planning, and then vendor risk management. Um, this all coincides with what I call, say, best practices around cyber hygiene. And to your point of that critical infrastructure information being lockboxed and protected is critically important. You mentioned the situation that unfolded at the FERC where our uh, uh, internal system was, was violated. We're still looking at that issue, making assessments on what kind of data might have been exposed. Um, and I think to the work of, of the folk at the FERC, we, we seem to be in a good spot in developing proper protocols around fishing expeditions and making sure that we are, are, are hygiene proficient as well. And that's what happened in that particular case. Okay, well, thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Mr. Long. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you all for being here today and for your testimony. Uh, Chairman McIntyre, recently City Utilities of Springfield, Missouri, has seen a substantial rise in transmission costs in the Southwest Power Pool. Most of these costs are related to funding transmission, transmission projects 
outside of Missouri. Some of the projects allow utilities to access renewable energy located outside the state. However, the benefits far outweigh by the uh, rise in transmission costs for the projects located far away. Southwest Power Pool's own studies have shown that city utilities' transmission costs and energy prices are substantially higher than other customers in the Southwest Power Pool. What will FERC do to address the issue of rising transmission costs in the Southwest Power Pool's footprint? I'm not familiar with the study you referenced, Congressman, but I will say that as a general matter, our transmission cost allocation is subject to policies under a landmark order we call Order 1000 that governs our transmission planning processes and the determination of how to allocate the cost of transmission projects across their geographic footprint. Generally speaking, it would be surprising that a particular entity paying those transmission costs is paying significantly higher than other entities served by the same facility. These are studies that the Southwest Power Pool did their own study, City Utility Southwest Power Pool did, so I'll get you that information, and if you can yes. have your folks look into it and get with my people, I would really appreciate it. Yes, I was going it, to make that offer. We'd be delighted. Sounds to like that. an egregious situation. So what will FERC, uh, will FERC address the concerns that some customers like those city utilities are paying for assets for which they have no benefits? Well, we do have processes in place today that enable en any entity that feels that it is paying for something it should not have to pay for, in effect, to initiate a complaint proceeding with us. And, and our role at that point will be to address the merits of the complaint and determine whether there's legitimacy to it. And if so, what steps we should take to remedy the situation. Okay, well, I know this you have... This is also something we can follow up on. I, I, yeah, I know you have some good folks, and I have some good folks, so hopefully we can get them sure. together, and uh, I think we're going to be in close contact for a while on this until we I would get welcome that opportunity. Thank you. And... Uh, Commissioner Chatterjee, in May, or on May 22nd, 2011, I'd been in Congress for five months, and we had an F5 tornado ravage through Joplin, Missouri, in my district, killed 161 people, took out 8,000 homes, 500 businesses, uh, leaving over 100, well, I already said that, 161 people dead and thousands without power. In your testimony, you talk about the importance of planning for potential catastrophes as it relates to electric vulnerabilities in a region, and you highlight the work being done by IOS New England. Can you talk about the proactive work being done to mitigate these risks and how other RTOs and IOSs can plan for catastrophic weather events? I want to start, Congressman, with saying that, you know, I mean, such events like that are just the, they're tragic, they can devastate communities, and, and obviously we all need to work co collectively uh, to get ahead of, uh, of these kinds of tragedies. Uh, we at the commission, you know, focus on, on electric reliability and, uh, and ensuring uh, that, uh, that uh, power remains available, that the lights stay on. Uh, the reason we are undergoing this uh, resilience proceeding is we want to make sure that in the event that the power uh, goes off, that it can be restored quickly. Um, I think as these types of uh, severe weather events uh, become uh, the new normal, we've got to take great steps to, uh, to get ahead of that. I was actually in Georgia uh, last week meeting with folks from Georgia Power about the extensive efforts that they take in advance uh, of storm preparation um, and, and, and afterwards. And so I think um, the private sector uh, will continue to do a tremendous job. I think our, our linemen and women um, are some of the bravest uh, people in this country. Uh, they should be uh, honored and recognized for the sacrifices that they make. And uh, we at the commission will continue to do our job uh, uh, to maintain uh, electric grid reliability. And, uh, and I'm counting on the great uh, line men and women of our country to, uh, to be responsive uh, in, in the light of tragic events like okay, unfortunately Thank you. And the we're running close to being out of time. So Chairman McIntyre, I have a question that I will get to your folks from my folks once again. Uh, concerning the Iranian hacker's attempt to breach FERC's computer systems, and I know we're in an unclassified setting here. I was going to have you explain as much in an unclassified setting as you can, but I will submit that in writing to your office, and I'd like to uh, have some answers on that. And also, what steps are being taken to prevent this from happening again? Absolutely, sir. I look forward to following up with you and your staff on that. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Mr. Wahlberg. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to the panel. Uh, this is a... Uh, panel we've looked forward to for a long time. It's good to have you all here. 
Um, I, want to, I want to dive right in with a, a fairly straightforward question, uh, which uh, I hope will be just a simple yes, no answer. Um, we can all agree that the energy landscape is vastly different than it was back in 1978 and even in 2005. Uh, do you believe that PURPA should be updated or modified to reflect today's energy environment? Yes or no, and beginning with the chairman. Yes, I believe it's time for us to look at that issue. Yes, I think it would be timely for Congress to look at PURPA. Yes, but I think uh, uh, not only should Congress look at PURPA, but FERC should look at our own regulations and to see what steps we may be able to take. Great. Yes, PURPA needs to be modernized. I think, it's, I think it's appropriate for FERC to take a look at some of the issues of PURPA, but I think the major issues that were addressed in the 2005 Energy Policy Act need to be addressed by Congress in terms of PURPA's future. Well, I, I appreciate the fact that it's a generally a yes answer. Um, uh, I think PURPA right now is holding us back on an all of the above energy plan. Uh, its intentions certainly uh, assisted in, in moving forward renewables. But right now we're holding back some of the renewables and being more efficient in, in the process. So I appreciate that. Chairman McIntyre, I'm pleased uh, that uh, FERC held a PURPA technical conference in June 2016. Uh, the docket has been open for nearly two years now, and I'm curious as to the timeline for acting and what possible actions you believe the Commission could take. There are a number of different actions we could take, uh, as has been referenced, any significant overhaul of PURPA would have to come from the Congress, but within the scope of FERC, some of the issues that, we've, that we look at and that we hear from constituents on constituencies, I should say, stakeholders on, are have we properly treated the question of how a particular project is measured? Some accuse some of the players in industry as in, engaging in gamesmanship and how they slice the size of a project. To take a project of a certain size and break it into smaller components for purposes of PURPA treatment so that it gets the benefit of being considered to be a so-called qualifying facility under PURPA. That's one of many examples I could give you. The states have a role here, too, because it is the states that determine the rate at which PURPA generators are compensated, the so-called avoided cost rates. So I think that these are issues that we can look at within our existing statutory authority. I appreciate hearing that. Uh, I would agree with you, and I agree in looking at PURPA uh, myself that while Congress I think ought to take action on it, yet there are significant changes, significant upgrades, modifications that I believe FERC can make on your own, and then we, we can follow on and be a, an asset to you. Um, uh, Commissioner Chatterjee, uh, you stated in your testimony that uh, significant changes related to PURPA would require congressional action, as, as we agree, um, but I'm under the belief that FERC can address many issues with PURPA. Uh, right now, including uh, problems uh, with the one-mile rule, which I think goes into gaming, as you, as you talked about, uh, Chairman, and reduce the 20 megawatt threshold of a quali uh, QF in organized markets if the FERC, uh, FERC uh, decided to do. So would you consider, uh, Mr. Chatterjee, uh, fixing the one-mile rule and adjusting the megawatt size of QFs in organized markets as significant change? Uh, thank you for the question, Congressman. And uh, just to, to clarify, what I said in my testimony was that major structural changes to PURPA need to come from Congress, but that does not mean that we can't look at things within FERC's own regulations. And I do believe both issues that you have identified, the one-mile rule and the 20-megawatt threshold, are things that, that FERC could consider and address. I think the record is already there to, to potentially act on the one-mile rule. and. Uh, while additional development of the record could be helpful on the uh, 20 megawatt threshold, there is already arguably enough in the existing record uh, that the co commission could proceed on it. And uh, uh, in the limited time I served as chairman, I stated that this was a top priority of mine, and I hope to work uh, with Chairman McIntyre and my colleagues uh, to work on these and other elements of it. While you have uh, uh, an excellent bill, um, the likelihood of that bill getting through my former colleagues in the United States Senate uh, could be a challenge. Uh, and therefore, I think it's incumbent upon us to, uh, to do what we can. Don't curse the project. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I see my time has expired, so uh, I, I yield back. Mr. Duncan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Commissioner Powelson, you mentioned 
In your um, opening statement, I believe that FERC is aware of the frequency of cyber and physical uh, threats to the nation's infrastructure, <clears throat> and that you believe that that threat is only increasing. And I want to commend the Commission for making cyber and physical security a top priority. How can Congress work together with you and with the administration to make this a top priority in our upcoming infrastructure reform bill? Congressman, great question. And I, I think it starts with where we've evolved over the last eight years with, with cyber, building these cyber protocols. Um, Interagency cooperation um, has been critically important. It started off really as a silo mentality, and now the dissemination of that information and that capacity building, as I mentioned earlier, down to the states, your state included. Um, that's a big challenge going forward, but I think it's a resource issue. Uh, resources as you know our operation at the FERC there's probably 20 to 25 people who are fully engaged in this effort the the effort that Secretary Perry's undertaking with his office of cybersecurity another step forward but um, I, I just think it continues to evolve um, there's no uh, silver bullet to this if I can use that expression lightly are y'all working with any uh, private um, entities and I guess the question is, are you familiar with what Clemson University is doing with the grid simulator and infrastructure um, simulator down in Charleston? Are you all familiar so, with that? So two things that, that, that you're seeing across the states that, the, that the we're involved with. One is the grid X exercise, which I understand is run by NERC. We also um, have these tabletop exercises. In my home state, we did what we call a black sky event. And you look at all these different scenarios and under, I guess, Chairman. Is, is it primarily looking at, at uh, cyber attacks when you do It that? is all part of that, yeah. The, because, I mean, you're familiar with the geomagnetic storms that have hit in the northeast and Canada, power outages. And, you know, we've got to be prepared for both natural GMDs but also EMPs, man-made. Because we've got Rocket Man in North Korea that, that could definitely send a nuclear weapon into the atmosphere and create an EMP. And I hope... That, uh, that you guys are looking at that as well? I think from a preparedness posture, I think we, I can say we are, uh, but it is, again, it, it's evolving. Again, another great step is the work at DOE and their cyber office and, and collaborating with the states. I firmly believe we're helping states build much needed capacity. You know, can we drill down on that, helping states? And, and let me ask how you're helping, say, the, the private or the small um, cooperative electrical cooperatives in the states. What are you doing to help those guys? Um, I don't know. That's a good question. That's the reason I don't know is some of these entities are not regulated by a state public utility commission. They're, they're part of public power. Right. Um, but I do know that public power is participating in, in these cyber protocols. So Let's bring it up a level to Duke Energy then. And uh, you're working with companies like Duke and Southern? We are. Okay. Yeah. In, in, in what ways? I mean, Technical advice, um, you know, well, you inviting Southern, them to these Southern, simulations? Uh, under uh, their CEO, chairman and CEO, Tom Fanning, he's a leader in the ISAC. Uh, we also do it through an audit process. Uh, Lynn, Lynn Good, who runs Duke Energy, is also active in that. We've had through the working groups at EEI the, the evolution of a cyber mutual assistance protocol, which again was, was, a, was a newly tasked effort. So these are, again, these emerging resources um, that are coming out of this, the discussions here in Washington. I think it's a good, um, it's a good posture for us to be, to be leading, um, but there are challenges, and I think those challenges start with, with providing those resources to build up these capacities. As we work on the infrastructure bill, I'm one member of Congress that hopes we will look at um, grid hardening as part of uh, the infrastructure uh, package that we do. Let me just ask one um, further question. Duke Energy has a, the Bad Creek Project in, um, in northern Pickens County, which is a hydro storage facility. They pump water from Lake Joe Cassidy to hydro storage facility, release it, turns the turbines during uh, peak demand, provide electricity for that uh, demand, and then during low peak, it'll pump the water back up, reverse the turbines, and store that water. It's a great energy storage concept. I know we're doing that with, a, with uh, solar power. Um, how active are y'all involved with, uh, I think Ms. Castro asked that question, with uh, the hydro storage for basically battery pass, uh, capacity for wind and solar? Mr. Duncan, if I may, I, I, yeah, I think we, we, we actually issued a rule several weeks ago which actually provides 
benefits not only for battery storage, but also for pump storage in terms of facilitating their, their participation in the wholesale markets. Um, and I think, I think that's, that's, I think what, what pump, in addition to that, the commission has authority over the, the licensing of hydro projects as well. So we'll be involved in that. But for the most part, it's actually just facilitating or ending uh, or eliminate those market barriers that currently exist to those types of technologies participating. Right. I thank you for that. My time's expired. I yield back. Mr. Lance. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank you and Ranking Member Rush for permitting me to participate today. I'm a member of the full committee, but I'm not a member of this subcommittee. Uh, uh, Chairman McIntyre, um, on January 19th, FERC issued a Certificate of Public Convenience and Necessity to the Penn East Pipeline Company authorizing a natural gas pipeline uh, through Pennsylvania and New Jersey, including in the congressional district I serve. The certificate also gave Penn East the legal ability to file eminent domain lawsuits against private landowners. As FERC opens a docket to re-examine the pipeline certification policy, what kinds of measures will you consider to ensure a robust economic analysis of public need, especially in those instances when precedent agreements are largely signed with affiliates of the owner, like in the case of Penn East? Well, as you know, Congressman, we have initiated a fresh look at our 1999 certificate policy statement that addresses some of these issues. We are looking forward to robust public input, input from stakeholders and the public on the important issues involved here, including the ones that you have cited. Right, thank you. Commissioner Lafleur. how will you ensure a project's environmental impacts are sufficiently considered a topic you discussed in your concurring opinion? I think that's one of the main issues we've te we will be teeing up for looking at when we look at the policy statement, both how we best do our environmental work on the traditional parts of the pipeline, but also um, downstream impacts of the end uses that the pipeline contributes to, including climate impacts. I think that'll be directly teed up. Uh, Commissioner Chatterjee, what steps will you take to prevent negative consequences on landowners, a concern you described in your concurring opinion? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, I, I did have concerns about uh, landowner protection, and it's something that as we uh, explore the revisitation of our pipeline certificate process, I want to ensure um, that landowners' voices are heard, that they understand the steps available to them uh, uh, to potentially you know, mitigate concerns that they may have, rerouting, um, and, and other types of elements. I want to make sure that they feel that their voices are recognized as part of that process. Thank and you. A commitment Commissioner McIntyre, Chairman McIntyre, as FERC reviews the pipeline certification policy, how will you ensure state and local rights are adequately protected? This past June, the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection denied Penn East a freshwater wetlands individual permit and a water quality certificate, which are required begin construction under the Natural Gas Act. What steps, if any, will FERC take to safeguard state and local autonomy? There are certain actions that are well beyond our reach in terms of our ability to restrict state roles assigned to them by statute. Often it is the case that these questions that come up have to be resolved by the courts, and I do not expect that to change anytime soon, but certainly we are reflective of and respectful of State's role. Uh, thank you. It's, it's my considered judgment that um, um, this is not in the best interest of the United States. It's certainly not in the best interest of New Jersey. And um, we in New Jersey, our state officials, have significant concerns with this. Uh, some of the pipeline would be under preserved land. And there is in the underlying statute, I think written in the 1930s, a, a, a belief in comity with state statutory law. And I would hope that the commission would uh, reexamine all of this. On a completely unrelated issue, uh, Chairman McIntyre, with regard to FERC's March 15th revised policy statement on the treatment of income taxes for master's limited partnerships, could you please explain your rationale in advancing a blanket prohibition of recovering of an income tax allowance for, or, for all MLPs? You may have discussed this previously, but I, 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 I respectfully ask you that question. Yes, that, that's uh, fine, Congressman. We were faced with a, an appellate court decision directing us to address that specific issue. We took action that we regarded as appropriate in light of the directives from the court. Uh, does any other member of the commission wish to discuss that? Commissioner Lafleur. I would just say that um, even before 
um, the United Airlines case that led to the March order. There was an earlier case where we were chastised for a court for double taxation. It's been brewing ever since then. We did a notice of inquiry and took a lot of testimony from people in the pipeline industry and others to try to build a full record and did not find any way to um, achieve the requirements of the court other than the way that we uh, thank issued. you for your uh, responses and I yield back three seconds and thank you very much mr. chairman my time has expired mr. Kennedy thank you mr. chairman um, I want to thank all our witnesses for being here it's nice to have a full complement of commissioners testifying before Congress grateful for your service grateful for the time for those of uh, you that I have not met yet I look forward to working with you and for those of you who I have welcome back over the past five years, I've become very familiar with FERC processes, more so than I ever thought I would. Um, I've appreciated the willingness of both uh, members from the commission and, uh, critically, your staff to engage with both me and my staff on this issue, and I look forward to continuing that uh, cooperation in the future. As you all know, the issue of transparency uh, and the opportunity to be heard have been a focal point of my work here in Congress and with the commission, and you've heard the issue about transparency come up a number of times from my colleagues today. Several years ago, ratepayers in my home region, uh, ISO New England, were shut out of the administrative and judicial review processes due to an unintended consequence in the Federal Power Act. Chairman McIntyre, I greatly appreciate your comments and your written testimony describing your commitment to transparency, sir. And as I've said before, if there's any lesson that I've learned here in Washington, it's that the more complex an issue is, the more likely that someone's being taken advantage of. So we've worked on a bipartisan basis on this committee to advance, in my estimation, a straightforward bill to address that issue. We're working with our colleagues in the Senate to try to find an agreement on the legislation. Under Section 205, the rates are allowed to take effect by operation of law if the commission does not act within a statutory time period of 60 days. Uh, I'd just start, I guess, with uh, Mr. Glick. To the extent that you know, sir, how often does that hap happen? How often does it take, or do rates take effect by operation of law? Are you familiar at all? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Kennedy. I don't. I couldn't give yeah. you an exact number. I, yeah. I could supply that for the record. I can tell you it is. It is relatively rare, although it is certainly foreseeable. Um, we have five commissioners now. You would think, but the commissioners do uh, recuse themselves on certain occasions, and you could very well have a two-two vote, in which case the commission would actually not be able to stop or either uh, or, or prevent a particular proposed change in the tariff under Section 205 of the Federal Power Act from becoming law. And is there a difference if, for instance, the commission fails to act within 60 days? A, a difference in the actual distinction? Uh, the only distinction is that, as, and I think as you pointed out, that, that the party that feels itself aggrieved doesn't have the ability to seek rehearing or, or take it to an appeal to the D.C. Circuit. And how do we know um, if a commission actually deadlocks? Is there a requirement that a vote be held, or is that more kind of custom and formal practice? There's no requirement a vote can be held. If, again, if the commission doesn't act at all within 60 days, it automatic, the tariff change automatically goes into effect. And so, Mr. Glick, what is the commission doing to ensure that agreed parties are not locked out of that review process? Well, um, again, I think, I think that, at least with this particular issue, it, it, I think it does require a congressional change. And I know you have a bill, and, and there's a bill in the Senate as well, Mr. Markey has, has put forward. But um, I, think that, I think the best we can do is actually ensure as much transparency as possible and involve public participation. But if there is a 2-2 deadlock, we are unable, I don't think we have the authority currently to address that. And uh, I appreciate that, sir. And, and I guess I'd go back to Mr. McIntyre, given your, your comments about transparency. Um, your thoughts on this issue and whatever else uh, the commission should be doing or can be doing to take on uh, the issue of transparency. Yes, thank you, Congressman. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a valid concern, but I personally am heartened by the fact that it arises very, very rarely. And I don't have a figure for you either, uh, but the one I've heard informally within the agency is once every dozen years or so. And Mr. McIntyre, and I appreciate that, sir. I don't mean to make light of that. Um, the fire hydrants outside my street haven't been used all that frequently either. I'm glad they're there um, because when they do need to be used, um, I hope they work. And so uh, respectfully and understood that it doesn't happen very often, but when it does, it comes with a fairly big consequence as we saw if in FCA 8 for residents in Massachusetts. And so just because it doesn't happen very often, I don't think, well, we can be heartened by it, doesn't mean that we shouldn't address the fact because when it does, it can be a big deal. I agree with you. In terms of legislative approach, <clears throat> if this is something where it would be helpful for us to work with you on language, I think right we, we'd be happy to do that mm -hmm. because language-wise, right now under existing law, 
unless a party is aggrieved by a commission order, an order of the commission, it cannot go forward to judi judicial review. Right. And so the lack of an order is what would be a, a stymieing factor there. Yes, uh, I agree. And Madam, Ms. LaFleur? Well, I am on record in favor of the Fair Rates Act. I believe I've testified or done it in a QFR or something before. I think it would be a good improvement to the Federal Power Act. I was on the commission. I was the chairman of the commission when we split two to two. We did put out statements of the underlying views and dispute to provide transparency. And um, I think we worked very hard to avoid deadlocks. I did believe, I was in the group that thought that the rates were just and reasonable, um, but I think the act would be a good improvement. I appreciate that. Thank you, Chairman. All set. Thank you. Seeing that there are no further members wishing to ask questions, uh, I would like to thank all of our witnesses for appearing uh, today, for sure. Before we conclude, I want to ask unanimous consent to submit the following documents for the record, a letter from the Utilities Technical Technology Council and a joint letter from the American Public Power Association and the National Rural Electric Cooperative uh, Association. And in pursuant to committee rules, I remind members that they have 10 business days to submit additional questions for the record. I would ask that the witnesses submit their response within 10 days upon receipt of those questions. If you can, without objection, the subcommittee stands adjourned. <laughs>